Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Sedgemoor District Council's Development Committee. This meeting is being held under the current government regulations brought in to allow for remote meetings to take place and to allow for legislative decisions to be made. It is requested that all participants of this meeting turn their mobile phones to off or silent. Hopefully those present will hear the meeting. However, in the event of a technical failure, the chairman will adjourn the meeting and set a new time to reinstate the meeting. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. All members of the committee should have their video on, but will remain muted until the chairman invites them to speak. All members of the press and public will remain muted unless they have registered to speak and the chairman will let them know when they can make their representation. The format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published and a copy of the officer presentations can be found on the committee web page. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I also welcome you to the development committee? I'm Councillor Phil, the chairman of the committee. Uh, just a few outlines of how the meeting will be run today. Um, each application will be taken in turn. The officers will outline the application and then there'll be a public speaking time. Members will then debate and decide on the applications before us. For members of the committee wishing to speak, uh, just to remind you, can you please indicate via the online chat uh, and you'll be called in turn. During the debate, there will be a proposer and a seconder for a resolution. The members will then vote on this proposal in turn, confirming that they have been present throughout the application being considered and will vote for, against or abstain. The votes will then be counted and the result announced. I'll now ask the officers and the councillors who are taking part in this meeting this morning to confirm that they can see and hear me and to introduce themselves. So if we can start with the, uh, the planning officers, please, uh, and uh, Dawn De Vries. Thank you. I can confirm I can see and hear everyone. Um, I'm the service manager for development management and I'll pre be presenting one of the cases today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adrian Noon. Yes, hello there. I can see and hear everything. Um, my name is Adrian Noon. I am the principal officer for the uh, the East. Um, I will be support case officers and um, presenters necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dean Titchener. Uh, yes, I can confirm I can uh, see and hear everything and uh, so I'm the senior planning officer for the East and we'll be presenting a couple of items today. OK, just to mention, Dean, you, you seem to be breaking up a bit, so you might in terms of presentations, we might need to address that later in the meeting, but we'll hopefully that might improve. Uh, from our legal section, uh, Dawn Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Dawn Lehman. I can confirm I can see and hear everything and I am the legal advisor to the committee. Thank you. From our Democratic Services, Leila Nicholson. Good morning, everybody. My name is Leila Nicholson. I'm the committee manager for this morning's meeting. Um, I can confirm that I can see and hear everybody at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we then come to the members of the committee itself, and we'll start with uh, Councillor Granter. Yes, good morning. Chairman, morning members. Yes, Councillor Graham Granter, Fairfax Ward in Bridgewater. I can confirm I can hear everyone loud and clear. Thank you. And Councillor Glassford. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, I'm Councillor Alec Glassford representing Fairfax Ward. I can hear and see clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Hello, uh, good morning. Um, Councillor uh, Lee Gibson from East Dover Ward, Bridgewater, and I can confirm I can see and hear the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members. Yes, it's Councillor Liz Scott here from the Axvale Ward near Axbridge, and I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, case officers and councillors. Sedgemoor District Councillor Alistair Hendry for Burnham on Sea Central. And yes, I can see and hear clearly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Yeah, Councillor Mike Facey, Burnham on Sea North. I can confirm, Chairman, I can hear and see all. Councillor Murphy. Good morning, all. Councillor Mike Murphy, Burnham North, and I can see and hear everything. Councillor Evans. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, mm -hmm. colleagues. Councillor Bill Revens, North Petherton Ward, confirming I can see and hear everything clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. 
Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yes, Kankster Stuart Kingham representing the West Podens. And I can confirm, I can see and hear all. Councillor Bradford. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Alan Bradford representing North Pethet, and I can confirm, I can hear and see everyone. Councillor Bolt. Good morning, everybody. Um, Brian Bolt, Councillor for Cannington and Wembden. I can see and hear the meeting. Councillor Perry. Yes, good morning, everybody. Councillor Liz Perry representing the King's Isle Ward. I can confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Good morning, everybody. Councillor Tony Grimes, Deputy Chairman representing Barrow Ward. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll confirm also that I've seen and heard all the comments back from members and officers, so that's fine. Uh, just to, uh, to also mention that obviously there are other uh, members of the public, there are officers and uh, other council members here today, some of whom who've registered to speak, some others are present purely to uh, to observe, and I believe that does include today also the portfolio holder for development. If we move then on to the agenda, just before we take the, uh, the, the agenda itself, I will just mention at this point that uh, two of the applications that were originally on our agenda, the applications on page one and page 11, uh, have been withdrawn from our agenda today. The reason for that is that the the local councils concerned, the town and parish councils, uh, were originally triggering these applications to come to our committee because they had disagreed with the officer recommendation. Uh, that has changed during the process since the agenda was printed, and those councils no longer oppose those applications, and therefore they are no longer on our agenda today. So we have just the three applications that will be before us, those on pages 19, 26 and 36. So if we move on to the agenda itself, uh, item one is apologies for absence. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've received an apology from Councillor Cathy Pierce. She will uh, be joining us later or being well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And all other members are, are present. Uh, item two on our agenda today is urgent business. I've not been informed of any urgent business that isn't already covered on our agenda today. So uh, item three is public speaking time for members of the public for those of you who've registered to speak today as i mentioned earlier the format of the meeting will be that we'll take the applications in turn uh, what will then happen is the officers will outline the background and detail to the application and then i'll ask you to come to address the the members uh, you'll have three minutes to do that uh, you when you have one minute of that time left to go you should hear a a bell i think there's an do you want to try again that not work not yet. Not hearing it? No. No? I, I, I don't know about other members. I'm not hearing the bell. Give it one last try, Mrs. Nick, because then we'll... No, I'm, I'm hearing uh, nothing. Hold on. on Let me just change my um, settings. Let's see whether that makes a difference. Oh, yes. That, that, I had it on the wrong setting. There Apologies. Was, there was... <laughs> there was definitely a ring that time. So anyway, you will hear a bell. If the bell doesn't go, we will step in and, and let you know there's a minute to go, but hopefully we won't need to. Uh, if you can obviously draw your comments to a close within the three minutes, that would be most helpful. And and again, what, what I will do is, is when we come to you to speak, I will ask you just to enable your microphone and, and we'll ask you to confirm that it's working so we can make sure that we are, are hearing you loud and clear. If we move then on to item four on our agenda, which is decorations of interest. Are there any decorations that members have, please? At the moment, I'm not see. Yes, I am. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I'm the ward member for um, Cannington and Wemden, uh, and but I've taken no part in anything to do with item 36, um, with it, any of the consults or anything like that. Thank you. Any other decorations from any other members? I'm not seeing any. So for, for members of the public, it's important that if members have a background or have had an involvement in an application, that they declare that. Uh, where you've heard the, the decoration today, that was an, a decoration for non-predetermination, which basically means on our committee, we have a, a standing order which says that members can either be involved at the town and parish council level, or they can be involved at the, the district level and making the decision here. The reason for that is that if they are involved at the town and parish level, there may be a perception that they've previously made their mind up before they came to this committee, in which case they would be predetermined. 
And to avoid that, as you've heard, the councillor concern says they've taken no part in those discussions and that leaves them free and able to attend this meeting, speak on the application and, and ultimately vote on it. Uh, there were no other decorations of interest, uh, so I, I, at this point I won't go into any other types of decoration of interest because they're not relevant. So if we move on then to the next item on our agenda, which is item five, which is the applications. Uh, as I mentioned, applications on page one and 11 have uh, been removed from our agenda. So if members can turn to page 19, where we have speakers present, and we're in the parish of Cheddar. And Mr. Titchener, I think you're introducing this one for us, please. I am. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I've turned off my camera just to see if that helps with the bandwidth. So I'll start with a presentation. If there's any lag issues, just let me know. We might have to see if someone else can present it. Um, Thank you. I'll just see if I can get that up and running now. Just let me know if that starts to come up. We've now got your front cover page. Right, OK, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so um, it's an application at a property called Mellingaves on Tween Town in Cheddar. So um, it's quite um, quite a number of alterations proposed. It's quite an extensive remodelling of, of an existing bungalow. So the proposals involve the erection of a first floor extension, two storeys front extension, porch, uh, rear south extension, construction of a swim pool in the garden and the conversion of the existing detached garage uh, within the plot into an annex. There's quite a range of um, proposals uh, there. Um, OK, just confirm, is that clicking through? Are you getting the next slide? Because um, there is a bit of lag at my end. Yeah, we've got the overhead with a uh, fine with a okay. circle showing the, the sign. OK, so and um, that's the site circled in yellow. So we're right in a very central location within Cheddar and the property proposes this one uh, here. So this is uh, the existing bungalow with this little um, uh, garage and I'll zoom in, but it's got a very large plots. So it's a very it's quite a, it's, it's a very generous plot for um, um, uh, you yeah, know, currently left und undeveloped. Many of these other sort of plots have been developed over time. Um, so just to zoom in, we get a sense of the, you know, the large, generous garden. There's residential properties on on all sides. Um, uh, so we're in a very much predominantly residential area. This block plan shows the, the relevant parts where the development is proposed. So the, the darker colored blocks are where um, the development is to be added. So this is the garage, which is to be converted. Um, porch extension here, uh, extension on the front. Um, is a long uh, single story extension here, small lean to extension here, and this block here is to be the swimming pool. Just going through the plans of the existing bungalow, uh, so it's it's pretty uh, standard uh, bungalow with a, a slight projection off the side. Uh, so, uh, and you'll see from the photo photograph. So we're just talking. Um, sort of, um, uh, uh, pretty standard sort of bungalow uh, render, uh, brick plinth, uh, pitch roof. The garage is uh, it's a double garage, very modest building with a mono pitch roof just to the side um, uh, of the, the pull in off the highway. And then these plans show in more detail the actual works proposed. So as I mentioned, it is very extensive remodeling. So they are effectively taking a bungalow and turning it into a two story property uh, with uh, effective front and rear extension. So the the front, uh, this section is to be added and then with a new double garage here um, with um, first floor accommodation uh, proposed above. Uh, so uh, extension, uh, a little lean to extension on the side long single story projection uh, into the rear going into the garden providing uh, a large amount of additional living space and then the swimming pool uh, sort of enclosed within this sort of area formed by this uh, single story projection so these are the elevations so it is quite different you know we started off with a bungalow obviously that's not what we're what what, what um you know we are going to be left with quite a a much larger two-story property uh, the projection of the front this sort of large uh, sort of feature gable here um, with a sort of recessed porch. This is the side of the um, that projection, the two-story projection to the front that will contain the new double garage. 
there is a single story projection on um, uh, what would be the east wing. Uh, that's uh, only only single story, as I mentioned. Um, then there are this this structure here is looking at the rear elevation. So I'll come to the side elevations, but that's actually the long sort of single story uh, projection that looks a bit like a finger that projects into the garden and runs alongside the um, uh, swimming pool. And then it's to be finished with painted render under a um, slate roof. Um, just note um, some of the, the sill and lintel details and the porch surround, um, just because that's relevant to some of the um, comments of the parish council that I'll come on to shortly. And again, these are the side elevations. So you get a sense of this is the, the long single story uh, projection that goes deep into, into the garden. So that's to be, uh, to be faced with timber. Uh, this is it looking at it from the other side. This is the projection to the front that will include the double garage with accommodation above. Uh, finally, just coming on to the double garage, the existing double garage, which they propose to convert to a small annex. So that's to have one, um, uh, one bedroom and then uh, open living space. So they're going to fill in some of the existing openings, put in some windows and a door. And just some photographs just to get a sense of um, of the property. So this top one is just looking from the highway. So it's set back behind these um, quite large, but relatively high uh, stone walls. And then you've got gate piers. So that's the bungalow in, in behind with its ex existing rendered walls um, and covered roof. Again, just looking a bit of a close up, the lower photo of the front. Um, some photographs of the sort of area. So it's got quite a large area to the front at the moment, used for parking. A large area, hard standing. Part of this will be covered with the new extension. The lower photograph shows the existing double garage when looking from the front, which is sort of set on the boundary of of, of the plot. Uh, another photograph just showing the edge of the garage, looking out towards the street scene. So they've got quite a bit of setback from any uh, uh, any other properties in the area. Uh, it's quite, the property is quite well set into the plot. These photographs are of the rear of the existing property, just showing um, its main rear elevation. And this lower photo gives you a sense of the depth of the garden, sort of stood towards the lower part of the garden, looking back up. Uh, so there are some properties uh, that adjoin, um, but it is within a generous uh, plot. And these last two photographs are also taken within the garden, just looking back down the garden, giving a sense of the depth within which this proposal is to be located. Again, this one here is looking back up. So in terms of the principal considerations, um, uh, design and visual impact is um, is one of those. So it's it is extensive remodeling, as we said. Um, it's a modest bungalow, but set in a very generous plot. Um, the existing bungalow isn't of any particular character. Um, there's no particular reason why we should resist its uh, redevelopment. Um, the surrounding properties are mostly two-storey, um, so a, it's not considered that there's a problem with having a two-storey property on this plot. That we feel that that could be readily accommodated into uh, the street scene. Um, Cheddar Parish Council have uh, raised uh, concerns in their objection are about a couple of the material choices that were proposed. Uh, slate for the roof and the use of Cotswold uh, stone. Um, if I take them one by one, in terms of the roof, the parish have stated that slate's not in keeping with the street scene, and they've put in a specific request that the property should be roofed with red pantiles. Now, red red tiles, typically clay tiles, are used on some of the uh, adjoining properties, and I'll show some photos in a second. Um, slate does also feature locally, so it's not it's not that slate isn't used uh, locally, and it is on, an, on a couple of older properties uh, nearby. Um, and I think when we look at the street scene, I think um, it'll become, it will see why, whilst there are more properties, I would say, with red tiles locally, the use of slate, it's difficult to argue the use of slate is out of character with the area, you know, it, when it's being used on some other properties. We're not in a conservation area, so we're not in an area that has really has a, a tighter level of control about material choices. It's also worth noting that the existing bungalow does not have red pan tiles on currently. It's got a dark coloured uh, square flat profile tile. Um, um, 
Well, I also wouldn't consider the use of slate to be contrary to the Cheddar neighbourhood plan because that the, the relevant policy is to state that proposals should conserve and reinforce local character. And if slate is in evidence within the area and is used on some tr traditional properties as well, then that would be seen to be part of what makes up local character. So I thought I'd take, in a, I'd take a couple of pictures um, um, from Google just showing the street scene just so we can get a sense of what the street scene looks like and what's nearby. So this is the bungalow here. So looking back up the nearest property, yep, yeah, that's got a tiled roof you can see. We've got a traditional old property just down the street that's got a slate roof there you can see. Uh, and then if we look back up the other direction, so this is the entrance here, so we're looking back west now. So property opposite, yep, yeah, that's got a tiled roof. Properties further down have got a tiled roof. Uh, this property's got a tiled roof with a much brighter tile uh, colour. Um, set up this nearby street is also an older property with a slate roof. So there's a bit of a mix. I'd say there's slightly more red pantile, but actually slate is used on a number of older properties. And I think it's difficult to argue, therefore, that it's wholly unacceptable in this area. And I think I don't think we could be that specific to say they must use red uh, pantiles. And just a photo uh, close up of the existing roofing material on the bungalow. So they don't have red tiles at the moment. They don't have profile tiles. They've got a very flat, very dark coloured and actually slate, slate probably looks more like this than a red pantile would. Um, the other comment was about the use of Cotswold stone. Now, the, as I've showed the plans, the principal elevations are actually in render. Um, uh, the Paris Council's comments were about um, they wanted to see any use of stone to be in, in limestone, which they felt to be more in keeping. Now, I think I can only assume that those com comments are in reference to the seals, the lintel and the port surround, because on the plans it did state um, those to be uh, bath stone. That's that's actually um, uh, that's actually a reference to them being of that kind of colour. Those so those elements are actually precast, so they're not made of natural stone. That's the precasting is what allows them to provide the shapes that you get with those kind of decorative details around windows and doors. Um, so it's reference to a colour. So not actually being made of a um, of Cotswold stone. That's just a, a colouring and just a bit of detail that the agent had put on the plans. It's not unusual that such would be of slightly different colour to the principal material used on the on on the elevations. I mean, overall, they're a very minor element of the overall appearance of the building. What you'll read is this is a rendered building under a under a under a slate roof. Precast elements of those kind of colours also feature within the vicinity. I think there were some in the street scene photos I showed previously. So I'm not sure um, that we could use that as a basis to say those features must be limestone. I mean, they have to be cast. They have to be of um, uh, pre-manufactured because otherwise you don't get the shapes that you need for um, for the, the the features proposed. So we don't feel that's a basis on which we could object to the application. Um, and just here's the detail, and just so you could see, so it does say here bathstone, lintel, sills and surround. So I think we're talking about these little uh, features just above and below some of the windows and around the porch. Generally a fairly minor part of, um, of a scheme, the kind of thing that if someone wanted to change to a planning application could normally be done as a non-material amendment. What you really read, you know, in terms of materials is this is rendered, this is slate for the roof, etc. Uh, rather than some of the more minor features um, in terms of the construction. Just coming on to the annex, um, the, uh, I've mentioned the garage is proposed to be converted to an annex and it will create a very modest one bedroom unit with a combined kitchen and living area. It is very small, and it is in very close proximity to the main dwelling. So in our view, it's very unlikely it could ever function as an independent unit. Rather, it provides a bit of additional living space for an older child to live with some some space, some separation from the main dwelling. We would consider, given its close proximity, that it would comply with our annex policy. We don't feel it could be readily, readily hived off. So there's so much shared, uh, shared space. It's so small, it didn't, couldn't really act as a, as a dwelling in its own right. The Paris Council addressed, requested a con, uh, the imposition of a condition to control its use. Um, and in some circumstances, we'd do that. Um, we wouldn't generally feel it's necessary to do it on a householder planning application. So, so on a householder planning application, you, you can't use that to uh, create a new dwelling. So a householder planning application cannot secure a change of use. Now, if you want to uh, create a new dwelling, that it always requires a full planning application. So the type of application they have submitted in this case 
offers the control that the parish council are seeking because you can't use it to create new dwellings. So in our view, you don't need to impose a condition because all the condition would, would achieve is to say, you need to apply for planning permission if you want to use this as an independent dwelling. But because they've submitted it as a householder application, they'd, they'd have to apply for planning permission if they wanted to use it as a separate dwelling anyway. So we get to the same outcome. Our standard practice in these situations would be to put an informative on the permission so that there's no doubt for the um, who has the permission about what it is giving them and, and that permission would separate permission would be required if they ever want to use it. So I think we're all trying to get to the same place. It's just about we feel this is the appropriate way to do it. Uh, and then just touching on a couple other relevant material considerations. So residential amenity does create a first floor accommodation. So that with that, there's always a potential for overlooking. Most new windows look north uh, or either north to the highway or south over the applicant's garden. There are two first floor extension windows which look east, so they have the potential to look over another property, but the separation distance is, uh, is about 25 metres, so it's in excess of any minimums we would use and no objections have been raised by the neighbour, so we wouldn't consider there to be a, any uh, concerns on amenity grounds. In terms of highways, the um, conversion of the garage would lose two existing parking spaces, but we're gaining two new spaces with the new garage, so there's, there's no net loss, and there is it, they benefit from a very large plot that has sufficient parking for vehicles on site anyway. So we don't consider it unacceptable on highway grounds, and no concerns have been raised by any party in submissions about highway-related issues. Just on ecology, this is an update because the um, the county ecologists had flagged up the potential bats to be habiting in the roof space. So a lot of works raising of the roof, the whole roof space being raised. Um, so um, a survey had been commissioned at the time that the committee report was written, and we had expected the results by the time of committee. Now, unfortunately, uh, that timetable uh, has slipped. The agents have confirmed, so we don't have that now. Now, so what it's recommended is that as there are no other outstanding matters, um, uh, delegated approval uh, would be uh, to grant permission should be given, but uh, subject to the removal of the objection from the county ecologists and the imposition of any conditions that they recommend. We feel that, that would address that issue. So the summary uh, and recommendation were, we feel that the design and appearance is acceptable. We don't feel it's going to have an adverse effect on the locality, so the street scene, amenity or highway safety, and subject to that delegated authority to impose any conditions arising from the ecology survey, remove the ecologist uh, objection. We recommend that planning permission is granted. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much. very much. As you'll see, we've, we've got uh, a speaker on this application, uh, Clive Panshok, if you could turn your microphone on, please, and just confirm that it's working for us. Yes, can you hear me, Mr Chairman? We certainly can, and just to confirm you're speaking on behalf of the Parish Council today, yes? I am indeed, sir. Yep. Excellent. If you start whenever you're ready, you'll hear the bell go when you've got a minute left to go, so please start. OK, I'm not quite sure why this application has come before this committee. This, an ex this is an existing property which is being extended upwards and outwards, which has an existing red tiled roof. Now, the picture you saw does not show it in its in, in its correct colour. I drive past this bungalow every day and I can assure you that it is a maroon red tiled roof. The parish council wish the new roof to be red tiles again, which is the same as the existing roof and in keeping with the surrounding properties close to it. There are approximately three properties in the whole length of Tweed Town which are slate. Also the lintels are Cotswold stone bar stone, it's just virtually the same colour, but Cheddar is a limestone area, so we are only asking that these are more in keeping with our area in Cheddar. We are not in the Cotswolds or in Bath, come to that matter. This comes under policy D2 of your local plan and policy B4 of the Cheddar neighbourhood plan. Finally, as the garage is being converted into accommodation, we have requested that a condition be applied to keep this in single ownership with the main house which the case officer has not mentioned in his recommendation, but it has done in his summing up to you. As consultees on this application, it appears we are again not being listened to. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? At the moment, I'm not seeing anything in the chat.
members, if anyone would like to uh, ask any questions or make any comments, please. Yeah, the chat's not working, Chairman. Excellent. OK, if so, we go with mem if members could uh, use the uh, raising your hand signals, if if <laughs> if that works, we'll wait and see. But uh, we'll cancel. Did you did you yes. want to start or alternatively after you yes. are going to Councillor Bolt? So Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, the uh, chat line is not working. Um, it seems rather a strange ob application to be coming before us today as the Parish Council Chairman or Representative uh, stated um, they're not against the actual development they're more in the details of the the roof slate roof instead of um, preferred tiles color of the lintels etc um, so it seems difficult to know why we've got this before us today as they're not objecting to the overall principle of the uh, application um, it's a shame it's a loss of another bungalow bungalows are quite rare these days to be for people to have but um again it's it's what happens these days but um i've got no objection to this application and uh i would uh, well i'll wait and i'll see what else comes up at the moment i'm i'm not actually up against it thank you thank you just just to confirm for members and members of the public the reason it's before us is because as things stand at the moment the parish council have objected because they they don't agree with the the proposed colour of the roof and the, and the, and one section of the materials, uh, and that's that's why it's before us because there is that uh, that objection. Um, but uh, Councillor Bolt, uh, just a quick one: Is there any chance we can go back to the pictures of the roof, uh, the existing roof now? Um, it, when I saw the initial photos, I thought it was a slate roof anyway. But um, we've got uh, Mr. Panchard saying that it's actually red tile. I just wanted to have a look at that. So, Mr. Yeah. Titchener, if you could just confirm that what we're what we're seeing, Dean. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag on the mute button. It seems. Um, okay, no worries. So, yeah, my my understanding is there are there are uh, a, a square uh, tile, flat uh, profile tile. Whether they're red, I mean, they certainly don't look. They're certainly very dark in colour. Um, uh, so. Um, I mean, you can get tiles with quite a range of colours. So whether they've darkened over, certainly over time, um, they don't strike me as being particularly uh, red, I have to say. Um, and I think you'll read it at quite because it's set back at a, fair, a reasonable distance from the highway. I don't think it's. I think it's quite noticeably different from the other red tiled properties in the area. Um, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the red of the chimney and the um, colour of the tile. It still looks uh, reasonably grey to me, but uh, we, we know what photos can do. OK, I've got Councillor Gibson and I think Councillor Kingham is, is waving at me, so I will <laughs> come for Councillor Kingham after after Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, they look quite... F I was going to ask about the tiles as well, uh, looking at them again, because it's, it's not maybe the best picture. I know it's like full on roof there, but uh, you can hit, you know, with the different colours and different lights and stuff. Uh, the, um, they look quite flat, which is usually a feature of slate uh, rather than um, ridged tiles or, you know, or do, uh, not ridged, but the, you know, the shape of of, uh, of clay tiles. Um, so I, I can't really, um, I can't really tell. To be fair. Also, I wanted to ask about the ecologist report. Um, now, why can't this wait until after you know this application? Wait until that report is in, and how how would that affect the application if it comes back and there were there are present uh, bats present or activity around this area? Um, I'd like to know that, please. Thank you, Mr. Titchener. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously it had been, we had been working to a timetable expecting to have those results today, and I think it's a shame that they haven't. Um, uh, so, and we were trying to just take it forward in a reasonably pragmatic way as the as the item was scheduled. I know we had a similar circumstance at the last committee where um, our, our members were sort of content to um, delegate um, some of the ecology matters. I think if the, 
survey comes back saying that there are bats present, they will let the ecologist is highly likely then to recommend that they have to do what's called an emergent survey, which is a second survey. So the ecologist won't remove their holding objection if that's the case until they get that second survey. So um, they will then have to agree to do that second survey. The county ecologist will have view of that and then they will, uh, uh, if they are satisfied, recommend conditions, which is what they normally do, even with with an emergent, uh, emergent survey. So it is dependent on the county ecologist removing their objection um, once they've seen that in information. So they need to be satisfied um, that the, um, the, the appropriate assessments have been done, the appropriate mitigation has been done before we'd be in a position to issue a permission. Mr Noon, did you want to comment on that? Yes, I, I ju just wanted to underline that you know, what we're saying here is that we don't determine this application until the ecologist reports are all with us. What we're suggesting to members is that if you are happy in all respects that the scheme is, a, you know, in terms of design and other impacts is acceptable, um, then the matter can be sort of effectively delegated, approval can be delegated to, to officers subject to the receipt of the necessary reports, the withdrawal of the objection by the ecologist and any conditions that he recommends be added to the permission. Hopefully that's that's helpful. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering um, what sort of conditions I'm, I, I know this is it. What if you know, uh, but the ecologist has um, has said no at the moment. Um, what conditions would be applied? Would it be to do with the roof or the extension upwards? Or or, or what, what could you just sort of um, give me an idea on that? And also I'd like to know a little bit more about the tiles because they do look flat. Um, and uh, yeah. Mr Tetchner, do you want to come back on the yeah. likely yeah. issues that will be picked up in conditions? I think part of the reason why they do the surveys, it surveys is to work out not just whether there are bats but what type of bats and sometimes the conditions they impose might be slightly different depending on what, what type of bats. What we'd normally expect them to say is if if there are if there are no bats, then they might say there's no further requirement for conditions. If there are bats, they might um, uh, they might end up with conditions about uh, we would secure a lighting design for bats, which will affect you know so there's no 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 lighting or minimal lighting associated with the property. At uh, an upper end, there might need to be, or there might need to be provision for back boxes to be secured by the permission. Sometimes you can have to secure a space in the loft uh, for a, a roost box um, if there's um, a much higher end, say, sort of, um, uh, you've got a small um, number of, um, like a colony of bats. Um, so that's that's quite an extreme example. We've seen photographs of the inside of the roof and it's all very modern and decked out. So I'd be surprised if we end up with that. I suspect it's more going to be at the lower end around conditions about um, lighting. That would be much more typical for a proposal of this nature. But ultimately, we will be guided by the advice of the um, county colleges. OK, can I just say one thing about that, though? That sounds quite nice to have on most houses that are being built or converted, that there is some access or some sort of support for bats around the, uh, around this area and the fact that it is in cheddar in that um area of outstanding natural beauty that the lighting in all areas should be at a minimum anyway um just i just wanted to make that point but yeah thank you dean thank you i've got councillors kingham scott and then henry so councillor kingham yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, is that the only um, picture we've got of the roof of the property? Because that um, that roof has got concrete clay plain tiles. It's just a flat clay tile, not a slate. I, I, I've got a few other photos. They're all a bit distant. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's clay. It's a clay plain tile. Yeah, that's that would be my assumption, but it's just a flat profile, but of quite a dark colour. Yeah, it's clay. It's got it goes that colour. That's what's okay. on the roof. Yeah, if that if that helps. Yeah, I don't I don't think Mr. Tinchner was saying it was a, a a slate as it stands at the moment. He was simply saying a slate wouldn't look a lot different because it's of a of a dark nature at the moment, but uh, and, and a, oh. a flat profile. Yeah, no, a slate tile will look different to that because slate is grey already and um, 
it doesn't weather like that, but that's a clay tar, which is yep. obviously weathered over the years. That's why it's that colour. OK, no, thank you. I've got Councillor Scott, Hendry, Perry and then Grimes. Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. A um, couple of points, really. Um, there are quite a few properties in Cheddar with um, slate roofs. And as has been pointed out, there is a, a large farmhouse just down the road with slate roof. So I don't actually think it would not be in keeping with the particular area. Um, with regard to having um, pan tiles on the roof, if you buy a modern pan tile, it would be quite red and it wouldn't weather to the grey that um, the clay tiles that are on it now, I don't believe. Um, so I wouldn't actually um, be objecting to having slate tiles on it. Um, with regard to the lintels, um, a dolting stone is a, a yellow limestone. Um, so I guess it's only a detail um, and maybe with a, a white render, a lighter yellow would look better than a grey, I don't know. Um, the other question I was going to ask about the ecology. Um, um, Mr. Titchener and um, has actually mentioned that um, the report will come forward from the ecologist and no permission will actually be granted just to make sure that actually no building works will take place before that um, report comes forward because although he said that there's no bats there when there are bats present you have to be careful about taking the roof off so this is a big extension um, the roof will have to come off at some stage. So it's just really to confirm that um, no works will actually take place until the ecology report comes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Titchener. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, they won't have, until we issue the decision, they won't actually have permission. I mean, I think, um, you know, if members are minded to grant delegated approval today, we'd obviously be liaising with the agent. We'd be more than happy to feed back the concerns of members about the, you know, um, you know, the need uh, that the permission require all works to only start once uh, permission was issued and after any pre-commencement conditions, if there are any, are um, are discharged. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hendry. Morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, case officer, for the presentation. This this whole whole debate about this seems to centre around roof tiles or slates. Nobody's at all mentioned or talked about the size of the building or the construction or anything else. It seems to be all based around roof tiles. Is it such a bad thing to allow this to have the, the dark grey slates? There are other properties around, as has been pointed out. It's not such a big thing, really, uh, because all tiles do weather in time, and, and they do darken down. There's no doubt about that. So to, if their choice is slate, I, I don't actually see the problem. And going back to the point that nobody's really touched on the size of the building, the swimming pool or anything else, there's no objections from any neighbours of any kind, nothing. And the only objections that seem to have come in, the bats is a separate issue, that's ecology, something different, but the only objections seem to be centred around the roof tiles or the slates. I, I just, I don't see why there's such a problem. And the actual the project itself, I think, is absolutely superb. So on that basis, I would like to move the officer's recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and just to confirm, Councillor Hendry, that is the the amended recommendation of a delegated permission. Oh, and of course. Also, also subject to the informatives that Mr. Titchener was talking about in terms of not not doing works before anything is uh, is agreed in terms of the eco ecology report. Well, of course you would expect that. That's part of the course, Mr. Chairman. Of course you do. But I still move the recommendation as it stands. Thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Perry, then Councillor Grimes. Yes, Councillor thank Perry. you, Chair. Yeah, um, I agree with Councillor Kim. Um, these are weathered plain tiles with hips, um, which have probably faded over the years. Um, but to, um, and I agree. I think I would like to second the recommendation with the thank conditions, you, please. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Grimes, then Councillor Gibson. So, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I don't have a problem with this at all. I think uh, red pan tiles or, or um, slate tiles, um, it's a matter of opinion because it, as it's already been stated that these are in the area anyway. So I think it is going around the houses and I totally agree with uh, Councillor Hendry on this. Um, and the 
there's already a condition into control a separate unit. I don't see any problem with this at all. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson. Hi, uh, sorry. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> I, I pressed the wrong button. Um, I was going to ask if um, the neighbours actually knew about this. I know sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, and because it was it was mentioned earlier that there's been no objections and that if they actually know that about the extensive extensive work that's going to be taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Titchener. Yeah, the, the regulations would require us to write to any immediately adjoining properties. So as there are a number of properties that share a boundary, they would have all received letters about the proposal. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, you've got your hand up. Did you want to speak again? No, sorry, Chairman, I thought I'd taken it down. <laughs> That's all right, no worries. I'm not seeing any other members indicating. So we have a proposition that's been moved and seconded, which is to grant delegated permission, uh, again, subject to those informatives about the uh, the ecology and, and not carrying out works beforehand. So I'll come to members in turn asking them for their, their votes on that proposal that has been proposed and seconded. We'll start with Councillor Granter, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that I've heard and seen all of the debate, and I'm certainly for the application. Thank you, Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the, the whole debate <coughs> for the application. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Yeah, hi. Um, I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Seen and heard everything I am absolutely for. Thank you. And Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Been present throughout the presentation, Chairman. Um, fully support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Yes, Chairman. I've been present. I've seen and heard throughout the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and my vote is for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present throughout the whole debate and I am for the recommendation. And Councillor Bradford. I've seen and heard the whole debate, Mr Chairman, and I am for. And Councillor Bolt. Seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Perry. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Yes, Chairman, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. And I've also seen and heard the debate and I'm also for. So, Mrs Nicholson, if you could just confirm that all members present have voted. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I can confirm that uh, that's a unanimous vote of 14 in support. Thank you very much. So that's clearly carried. So delegated permission is granted. Members, if you can turn to our next application where we have speakers present, which is on page 26 and the parish of Gothurst. And again, Mr. Titchener, please. OK, just get the presentation up. Right, just let me know when it's coming up on your screen. Yeah, we've got your cover sheet now. Excellent, OK. Uh, so it's um, an application uh, that's been described in the form as the erection of an agricultural workers dwelling with access and parking. So it's located at um, a complex uh, known as Cobbs Cross Farm, Andersfield Road, go first uh, to the west of Bridgewater. Uh, so just on the aerial, I presume that's ticked over, has it? Um, yeah, we've got the aerial. Excellent. Right. So, yeah, we're just located out out to the west, heading towards the Quantock Hills, which starts sort of uh, shortly um, to the west of the site. Uh, so just a bit of background about the site itself. So it, the complex is known as Cobbs Cross Farm. So it was originally a farm, still does farming activities, but it has diversified 
in recent years to also provide visitor accommodation under the brand of um, Secret Valley. Um, so they provide glamp, uh, glamping type uh, accommodation. So they have a range of things uh, such as yurts, uh, these wigwam type structures, bell tents. Um, uh, so it does need to be said at this point that some of those tourism units do not currently benefit from planning permission and are unauthorised. Um, there are various buildings across the holding. Uh, so there's a little main sort of complex of buildings where there's some buildings in agricultural use. Some buildings there are in visitor use and associated with the holiday accommodation at the site. There are three dwellings currently uh, as part of the holding, uh, a farmhouse on the complex and then uh, two nearby cottages. Um, we are close to, but outside the Quantop Hills area of outstanding natural beauty, and there are several public rights of way cut across the site. So um, the yellow area circled is where the proposed dwelling to go, but the actual complex um, is uh, encompasses all uh, these buildings here. So uh, this is sort of the road that runs um, through the main part of um, uh, near the site and that you come in off and access here. So the main sort of farming uh, activities have been sort of focused around some of the buildings here, the main farmhouses here, and then as you move uh, out towards these fields, these little uh, 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 markers you can see here arranged around the edge of these fields as some of the holiday uh, accommodation. Um, there is other holiday accommodation uh, in this southern part here. Um, so one of the farmhouses here, the two nearby cottages are here, um, just uh, a few minutes walk up up the road and then the public sort of rights of way that cut through the site cut through run along this sort of a route here one of them uh, and then another one splits off and heads in this direction so they run through the site and run up towards the, the, the Quantock Hills. So in terms of the permission that's being sought um, so it's for the erection of a fourth dwelling on uh, as part of this holding so it's to be erected on uh, rising land, so it, which is about 200 metres to the west of the main buildings complex. So the land sort of rises as we're and undulates as we're getting towards the sort of lower parts of, of, of the Quantock Hills. Um, the dwelling would be occupied by the applicant's uh, son, and it's to be a two bedroom bungalow of brick and tile uh, construction. So this is a red line plan just submitted with the uh, with this uh, proposal, just showing. Uh, um, the site that would be here, so located, um, as I said, about 200 metres to the west of the main main complex, coming through existing tracks uh, through the site um, off the and showing the connection to the public highway there. So the bungalow is going to be located in this sort of corner of the site with its own sort of pull in turning area um, uh, and uh, with uh, existing post and rail fencing uh, denominated and a garden to serve the property. So this is the elevations of the proposal. So it's got a sort of um, fairly um, simple form. You know, it's uh, uh, a couple of bedroom bungalow with a uh, sort of a linear sort of pitched roof um, and um, projecting porch uh, of brick and uh, and tile as stated. And just some photographs to get a sense of, of the site. So this top picture shows the main farmhouse. So here we are at the point where you come in off the road. So this is kind of the first part of the site you would see. So it's uh, it's a period farmhouse um, uh, of, sort of quite pleasing appearance. And you come in past a number of traditional barns. So that's the first part of the site that you would see. So that's leading down this sort of track, which brings you into the site, um, sort of a stone timber boarding, tile roof construction. And then this sort of photo here shows some of the um, uh, holiday units. So these are the ones that they call sort of wigwams, so the sort of structures um, located in one of the fields here. Um, uh, so that's that's kind of typical of some of the units at the site. Um, and then you then the sort of mended uh, Quantock Hills rather start um, uh, the hills get stuck slightly higher, the land gets slightly higher as we move beyond. This lower photo is is taken across. Uh, where the dwelling would be uh, located. So in this southwestern corner of the site, again, it's on slightly higher land and the land continues to rise beyond. Another photograph, just looking through that uh, place where the dwelling is to be located, just coming in from a different angle uh, across the existing gate. A couple of photos looking 
back down, so stood sort of past where the site is, looking back down towards so the main complex is sort of um, in the distance beyond here. You've got sort of the public right of way that runs on the inside of the hedgerow down through here, back towards the main part of the site. Again, just for context, you can see that actually the holiday uses kind of sort of stop once you get this far down into the site and you know, some of the more agricultural uses are what sort of predominate in the area around. Um, this shows from taken within the uh, public right of way, looking back down, uh, which sort of runs parallel. So you get, a, you can see the main farmhouse and some of the buildings complex in the distance, just to understand sort of the relationship in, um, between the two. You know, so there is some separation. So you get a sense of a bit of the complex. So they've got some more modern farm buildings sort of to the rear of the site that aren't so visible once you um, initially enter. And again, just from the other public right of way, which runs through looking across, you just get a sense of some of their other structures that they've got on the site. So in terms of principle of development, um, so policy D10 is the most relevant policy. So it says, um, so this is policy about agriculture and rural workers dwellings. So it says new dwellings to meet the accommodation needs of permanent workers in agriculture or other rural businesses can be acceptable, provided there is a clearly established existing functional need to live at their place of work uh, and which cannot be met within existing defined settlements uh, or through any existing dwelling on the holding or any building capable of being converted. So the way we look at this, as we've done various applications of this type, is look at this thing called a functional test. So the test is necessary to establish if it's essential for one or more workers to be readily on site at most times. So it might, so such a requirement might arise if workers are needed on hand during typically during the night as well as the day. So they need to be there at most times to, to carry out these, these functional uh, requirements. Most often where we see this, it's large cattle operations. So where they're doing carving, you know, that often happens at night. They need to be there. It, you know, it might happen at various times of year. And where the implications, if they're not there, obviously, you know, you might lose livestock, you know, you, you know um, mum and baby, you know. So it's, you know, that's that's the most likely one where agricultural workers' dwellings are, are granted. So it's important to, to note that functional need will differ from a convenience need. So convenience need is where, for, you know, it may be more convenient for someone to live at or near their place of work. You know, that might reduce on, say, commuting time. But that doesn't amount to a clearly established functional need. So there is important to make that distinction. So and permission should only be granted whether they've made a, uh, identified a clearly established functional rather than convenience need. It must also relate to a full time uh, employment, not part time. So that's why uh, man hours calculations would be um, requested and submitted as part of any application. So in terms of what takes place at the site, so as I've stated, it's a farm, it's diversified to provide tourism stay. So they've got about 400 acres, so it's quite a large site. They have 180 cattle, they've got free range chickens, they grow oats, they've got vines, they also have quite a large area where they grow Christmas trees. So there's quite a, a range of agricultural activities taking place. Now, the glamping type tourism units, as I said, you know, there's yurts, shepherd huts, wigwam structures. So they've got uh, a variety of those and about totally about 30 accommodation units on site. Now, the planning history would indicate that only six of these units have planning permission. The remainder are unlawful. Uh, they also have an outdoor activity centre um, and a barn which uh, is used for wine tasting. There are previous permissions for those, so those are um, without doubt uh, lawful. Now the, the case put forward to justify the dwelling is that the applicant's son needs to live on site to cover all types of farm work and for managing tourism activities. So their case that they put a man hours calculation in to indicate that it related to full time work, you know, and across the range of operations, you know, if you look at the hours, they say this could support four for four full time workers. Their case that is that living on site would ensure the proper care of the tourism business could be undertaken, uh, as well as roles on the farm without the delay of commuting from Taunton. So what they're saying is the son in this case is more involved in the tourism, is mostly involved in managing the tourism aspects 
but does also get involved in the agricultural aspects as well. Um, now we sought clarification on the out of hours activities because these are fundamental to assessing whether a functional need. So the man hours calculation is only part of that. That's helpful in showing, in showing that it, it relates to full time work. But we need to know what are the what are the activities that take place out of hours that justify functional need. You know, because many people will have a job that requires them to be on site during the day, but that doesn't amount to a functional need. Um, it's being it's the out of hours activities that need you to be there twenty four seven. So um, subsequent information was provided by by the agents listing a, a range of activities undertaken uh, by um, uh, by the, the uh, future occupant of the property of the sun. So these roles included emailing visitors prior to their stay, providing welcome packs, litter picking, dealing with visitor inquiries, dealing with visitors arriving in the evening, managing noisy groups and dogs, finding missing children, maintenance so fixing light bulbs keys toilets etc lighting hot tubs directing couriers takeaway deliveries and taxis to accommodation finding lost items being on site for 999 emergencies or fires confronting suspicious persons and then in terms of so that's obviously the tourism related stuff and then in terms of the agricultural checking on chickens closing sheds at night loading birds onto lorries spring carving hand feeding of cars retrieving retrieving of lost cattle so the activities are quite wide ranging and take in tourism and agricultural duties. The test though, is whether they amount to a functional need to be on site at most times. And of course, whether any such need could be met by existing dwellings. So we do consider that many of the tourism functions that they or activities that they say they have to do are part and parcel of managing a holiday business. You know, that's about managing a site appropriately and providing a good service. Don't dispute that. But do they require someone to be, I mean, they require someone to be on site at various times of the day, but that is a requirement of many jobs in rural locations. It would undoubtedly be more convenient for someone to live on site to carry out some of those functions. So for, if, for example, a visitor arrived late or if there was a nuisance inquiry. But in our view, it would not justify a dwelling, particularly as we're talking about in locations where they're not normally supported. The functional need also needs to be considered in the context of other existing dwellings. So as I stated, this is a permission for a fourth dwelling at the site. So I mentioned they have the farmhouse located here at the entrance. So that's occupied by the, the, the applicant's other son, who is involved primarily in the agricultural operations at the site. So involved in managing the farm, managing the livestock, the animal welfare. They have two cottages located a couple of minutes walk just up the road. So the, so the applicants live in one of those, so they're both involved in managing the farm and the tourism functions, including things like bookings, housekeeping, site monitoring. The other cottage is occupied by a farm worker whose role involved is working in terms of like managing the, uh, some of the livestock on the site, so that's uh, they're involved in the just the agricultural side. They also employ, um, because of the nature of the business, some other employees, some of which are seasonal, some involved in uh, some in the farm work. So when they need to bring people in, some involved in the tourism, you know, sort of cleaning out of the site, dealing with the booking. So there's you know, so there's a range of other other people there. Now, the functional need to manage the tour tourism aspects. Um, so what they're saying is they need someone on site for these tour tourism related functions. But there is already one dwelling occupied by the applicants in close proximity to the site and they already have a role overseeing some of the tourism functions of this site. So should an out of hours requirement arise, late visitor etc, it's not the case that there's no one nearby to provide any immediate assistance. There is already one dwelling that's providing some tourism oversight in close proximity. Now the local planning authority, you know, we have significant doubt that the tourism functions themselves, just looking at the activities put forward, really generate a functional need if you look at the nature of the activities. But even in spite of that, there's already a premises on site which could address some of those out of hours requirements. Now, in terms of any functional need for the agricultural aspects put forward, they've already have three dwellings in that case with occupants who are working in, in some level of agriculture. So when out of hours emergencies arise, so say carving is one thing, you know, that's most obvious and, and you know, uh, most important, there's already various persons on the holding who could immediately deal with that issue if needed. Um, so for those people, 
and, and for those people, managing the agricultural activities appears to be the main part of their role. So any exist any agricultural functional need arising would appear to be already addressed by the existing premises. The policy would also require us to sort of um, look at other suitable dwellings. So we haven't had any information provided to demonstrate whether there's any properties in the wider area that can meet the need. Normally we expect a bit of a schedule about other properties uh, nearby, their values, whether they are realistic or not to meet to meet the need. Um, and uh, that could en encompass quite a wider catchment. What, when you're talking about the, the fourth dwelling on the site, it could be acceptable that, that person could live slightly further away. So you'd expect a reasonable sort of catchment area in terms of looking at what other properties um, uh, could be provided. There are also various existing buildings on the holding. and We haven't got an analysis from uh, the applicants or their agents about whether any of those have the potential for conversion. And just in terms of, I've mentioned that the un unlawful uses, so some of the tourism stay aspects do not benefit from planning permission and are, and are unlawful. Uh, so there's only about six when you check through the planning history that seems the six of the tourism units that actually seem to have permission. Now the applicant states their intention to regularise this situation without without delay and I understand they've uh, submitted an application, it's not valid yet, but they've submitted an application to get that process started. A functional test however can only be based on lawful uses at the site so we can't be taking into account elements that have not yet been assessed as acceptable through the planning process. So much of the functional need argued by the, uh, the applicant is unfortunately having to be disregarded, uh, will have to be disregarded because of the unlawful activities it's currently based upon. So in our view undoubtedly you know living on site would be it would be more convenient to undertake the duties the tourism duties proposed um, but we do not feel as a clearly demonstrated uh, established functional need for a further dwelling nor has it been demonstrated that any out of hours needs could not be met by existing dwellings on the holding or any other possible dwelling either in the air or through conversion so unfortunately we do feel the proposal uh, is contrary to policy d10 the rural workers dwellings and therefore we're not satisfied with the principal development unfortunately, on this case. Just a couple of other areas of material considerations I want to touch upon design, visual and landscape, landscape impacts. You know, policies talk about high quality design, it's positive, positively responds to the character of an area uh, and landscape policy is also relevant here, so D19, because we are within the setting of the air, of Quantop Hills, area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, that says proposals uh, if harmful should only be supported if harm to the landscape can be negated through mitigation. So the proposal is the direction of a bungalow. It is on land uh, about 200 metres to the southwest of the buildings complex. The Quantum Hills themselves start about 600 metres to the west. So the local landscape is quite undulating. It's quite re reflective of the fact that you are getting closer to the, uh, the, the Mendip Hills as the land starts to rise and sort of fall, and, but uh, you know, as it's gradually rising towards the, um, uh, those hills. Um, the buildings complex, the existing building complex is in the eastern part of the site and at a lower elevation. Uh, the land rises to the west and the dwelling is to be sited on part of this rising land. Uh, there's various public war rights away that cross the site and some cross across the front of uh, where the, the proposed dwelling. Uh, so it would be visible from a public vantage point. So the Quantum Hills A and B team have responded to the application. They state that activities at the site you know, have an impact on the character and the landscape of the area of outstanding natural beauty. They, they're aware of the planning tests uh, that, um, you know, that a new dwelling in this location must be fully justified on business grounds, but only if it cannot be met by other provision. They note potential for harmful impacts from the development and the domestication of the area. Um, we consider, unfortunately, that the siting of the dwelling is in quite an isolated position, so it's not been situated near the existing building group. The applicant states that they feel that it's in the best place for them to manage the tourism aspects uh, of the proposal from. Um, I, I think it, it could easily be those things could be managed by having cited it in a more sensitive location near the existing building groups at a lower elevation, uh, not isolated. It will be visible from public rights away. Uh, as I said, one passes immediately across the front of a location. Um, and we do consider the erection of a dwelling in this location separated from other buildings and on rising visible land will give rise to harm to the setting of the area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, 
so just in terms of the actual design of the dwelling, we, we do have a little bit of concern about its design. So it's submitted as a bungalow. Um, policies would require proposals to positively respond to and reinforce local character. And it is a sensitive location. It's countryside, but it's also in close proximity to one of our um, areas of outstanding uh, natural beauty. So some of the nearest uh, buildings are of quite traditional form. I've mentioned, let me show the photograph there of the traditional farmhouse. Um, with um, Quantock uh, stone it's constructed and then some of the converted barns are stone constructed so it's un unclear how a bungalow has taken its design cues from the local context it doesn't seem to relate to any of the traditional buildings on site and it does seem slightly out of context with its location and its setting uh, where traditional character and form tend to dominate so um, we remain unconvinced that it's fully taken account of the sensitivities of the countryside and landscape and feel that we're unable to support the design as, and siting as proposed. It's finally coming on to some, a couple of other matters. So the county ecologists had responded to the application, states there are a number of ecological features on site which could be impacted or lost as a, as a result of the proposal. Notes the application is not currently supported by ecological surveys, so no understanding of how species may be affected nor mitigation proposed is necessary. Um, recommends submission of a, of a survey um, uh, and until such time maintains a holding objection. So the proposal currently remains unacceptable on ecological grounds. I think there's a difference with the previous application where, um, because in this case we are recommending refusal on ecological grounds, but that's because we do have concerns about the principle of development here, whereas the previous application, we had no other outstanding concerns. So there is a difference. Um, so uh, until such point as there's a um, surveys, um, uh, then the, the, it, we would be recommending refusal on ecology. Now on other matters, um, just to cover these. So we don't feel there's any highway safety implications from the proposal um, um, in terms of uh, impact on at the point of access has got quite good visibility access you know, but it's going to be detrimental impact on the highway network so we don't feel that's a concern access is via public right of way so the applicant would need to satisfy themselves you know that they, they, they have a right to drive on that path and if permission were granted we would address an informative to that effect uh, but in summary uh, whilst it's, it would undoubtedly be more convenient for the, uh, for the applicant's son to live at the site we don't feel a clearly established functional need for a further fourth unit of accommodation has been demonstrated, nor has it been demonstrated why any out of hours need cannot be met by the three existing dwellings on the holding. Much of the case unfortunately relates to tourism uses that do not have planning permission at the moment. And we have concerns about the design and siting given the sensitivity of the area and the, obviously the absence of any current ecological surveying is such that for the reasons set out above, we're unfortunately recommending that permission is refused in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, we have uh, two speakers on this application. So if I could ask Councillor Caswell, if you could turn your microphone on and just confirm it's working for us, please. Can you hear me, Chairman? Certainly can, Councillor Caswell. Please start whenever you're ready and you'll hear the bell go when you've got a minute of your time I'm, left. My video camera is not working for some unknown reason, but just saying that. Thank That's you. Right. Uh, thank you, Chairman. To say that I'm fabric acid, that this application has not gone through, is an understatement. This is a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day operation, as any farm is. Councillor Pay and myself have visited the site, and to be quite honest, I asked the question, what is wrong? We hear that it's 600 yards from the AONB, this is something that's often used, that it's near the AONB. Um, but when an application comes forward that, that, that uh, wants to be passed, it's, oh, it's outside the AONB. This is outside the AONB. It is adjacent, I give you, but it is outside. Now, in the past, when I've sat on the This Is Seen Committee and when I was the portfolio holder, we have passed many applications for agricultural workers' properties. One I remember was in flood zone three and under a Dutch barn. This, so what is different about this one? It's not in flood zone three, and it's vital to the well-being of the livestock and the running of a diverse farm and attraction. As stated, this is a 24 hour, seven day a week, 365 day operation. COVID, as, as everything has impacted greatly on this business, as it has the rest of the country. 
we're now in a situation of staycation. And that this is the world we will wander. Uh, um, and this will be a wonderful place to stay. It's excellent, diverse, and just what our country, country and countryside needs in this awful pandemic. I urge you to pass this application or to at least do a site visit to see this facility for yourself. There's no objections from anybody, anybody local, including councillors, parish councillors, and all fully support this, what is needed and what we need to have. I urge you again to pass this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Lyndon Brett. Mr Brett, could you just confirm that your microphone is working, please? It's working. Excellent. Good morning. Uh, again, you'll hear the bell go when you've got one minute of your uh, time left, so please start whenever you're ready. Chairman and members, this is a reapplication following your request for more information on functional need, which was provided and has been further augmented. No site inspections were carried out to make an initial assessment. This is the fourth officer and the first communication received was a demand to withdraw with no previous dialogue, despite the officer not visiting site until one month later, unannounced and in lockdown when closed, being unable to assess labour need and no opportunity for client to explain the business. We then had a demand for an ecological report with none requested on the prior application or two registration checks. I asked for an extension of time, which we freely extend your offices, but there was a blanket refusal. The NPPF encourages farm diversification and there are various consents relating to this but the business has developed exponentially with annual increments despite COVID and a regularising application has been submitted over two weeks ago, but not yet registered. The business is on a sound footing, offers local employment for up to 25 people when none other would be available and brings into the local economy through average direct spend just shy of £1 million, which itself gets churned into a significant multiplier of this, which is why tourism is key to the district. Does the district need this type of business? Yes, it does, and clearly benefits from it. The farm staycation market is strong, but the reputation and booking sector respond to good offering and customer service, which has to be 24-7, 365. Farming is not a 37 hour a week business, and there are two strings to the business here, 40 acres of organic agricultural production with higher levels of labour need and tourism, both having hands on management and husbandry at heart. Organic farming is more intensive and the functional need case for the addition of tourism diversification has been made. But if members want to see for themselves, then please opt for a site visit. Management of guests for anyone in the know who has operated a business of this nature is as high maintenance as flocks of young birds if not more so, as they have a voice. And if customer service is below par due to one hour response times from Taunton, this will have a significant damaging impact on the business reputation through adverse social media feedback. Response time is key for a positive experience for all guests, but importantly, to provide a check on guests who can be disruptive and spoil the enjoyment of others, if not nipped in the bud. It is important to get a top hosting feedback as super hosts. The dwelling is required for Will's family who cannot be expected to share the farmhouse with his brother's family. The officer critiqued the design of the dwelling, so this was changed to a two-storey dwelling, but he has refused to comment or reconsult on the design. This business, like any business during lockdown, has been adversely impacted, but the response to the staycation market has seen bookings increase for the out-of-lockdown periods. SMEs are meant to be encouraged, so I would commend this genuine on-farm provision need to complement this diversification business and help service and maintain its increased demands. I, I think we've lost we've lost a microphone there. Um, did I didn't hear a bell? I don't know whether anyone else did, but uh, did did we run out of time, Mrs. Nicholson? You're on about two and a half minutes. Ah, sorry, we, we heard there was no bell. We, we heard nothing. So uh, sorry about that. Um, sorry, Mr. Brett, but uh, obviously you've gone over. You have gone over time, but uh, I think members got the, uh, the, the, the 
the gist of what you were saying. So thank you very much. Uh, I've got a couple of members who've who've indicated. So we'll we've got councillors Revens, Hendry, and Bradford. So we'll start with councillor Revens. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I had the privilege of growing up in Gothurst and my family uh, lived there for many, many years, so I know this site very well. Um, and my heart so much wants to wants to grant this. I've been very concerned by what I've heard from Mr Brett in his statement there. That being said, I would have concerns about this application. We don't have um, the detailed functional need that we'd normally expect to see, the analysis we'd expect to see for this sort of application to go through. Um, I'm very, although wherever the, the boundary line of the AONB is, um, I've always thought it was in the wrong place because I think there's some even more outstanding areas outside the AONB um, that aren't included. I'd like to understand how prominent this is in the landscape. Um, I don't, we don't have a landscape assessment with it. I'm very aware that there are outstanding um, heritage assets within the, the the immediate environment of it. I'm thinking of the Temple of Harmony and Haswell House and all the follies that go around that area. Um, well, I, I want to understand how this would impact the setting of those as well. They are vital to the tourism um, business that this um, this this meets. Very concerned we don't have an ecology statement that goes with it. Um, and and concerned about the design and the lack of an analysis of what other buildings are available. Um, it does feel to me, you know, I, I was I was reflecting as 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 we were listening to the presentation of the yeah you know, the four farms in Gothurst and how they've developed and changed in my lifetime and the different markets and 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 businesses that they've now become. I so want to support the development of Secret Valley and Cobbs Cross Farm with all their enterprises. Um, I would possibly suggest that we could go for a deferral on this rather than send the message of a, um, a rejection of this application um, because I feel that it's that there is so much more we need to know before we can pass it, but I want to pass it and that's the, the huge difficulty I have with that. So I, I would hope that I have a seconder for that proposal and we can come back at some point. And I, I particularly like the idea of doing a site visit to somewhere that has a wine tasting shed as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Uh, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just before I, I really speak, just a, a question for the case officer, Dean Titchener, it might be relevant or not relevant. Would this be on a septic tank or on the main drainage? Do, do you know that? What's, what's the situation there? Mr. Titchener. I have to say off the top of my head, I don't know. I suspect it would not be on. I'd, I'd be surprised if it was on main drains just because of the separation. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, main yeah. provision would be. OK, all right. OK, I, I'm quite happy to hear what everybody else has to say. Absolutely. It goes without saying the first two speakers, I think, were, were ab absolutely very correct uh, in that I think it's a tad harsh to say no to this, and that's the honest truth. There are so many plus points and not so many minus points, shall we call it. I don't have to, to go over it all again because you've already heard it. The The application for this bungalow doesn't impede on any other property whatsoever around it. It's It doesn't sit on an AOMB. Uh, it's just, it's, it's very difficult to see why this would be turned down on, on the reasons actually put forward. And the first two speakers, as I said, were actually very correct. Councillor Bill Revens, he touched on a few points too, and he's apprehensive as far as I can see about turning this down flat. At this moment, until I hear everybody else speaking, I, I'm not keen to go with the officer's actual recommendation, but I'll hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've heard the first two speakers and they said a lot of what I want to say, to be honest. Um, I think it'd be unjust to, to, to throw it in and, and reject it just like that, to be perfectly honest. Um, I know the place. In fact, I buy my Christmas tree out there, and it's always a thriving, busy, busy place. There's no question about it. That it's a 400-acre farm, geared to most modern things. That farming demand today with diversification in practically everything. It's been a naughty boy regarding the hats. I don't like it, but uh, there you are. 
Um, these things happen sometimes. Um, and in this COVID period of time, everybody seems to be afraid to go on site visits. We almost made a dreadful mistake at Lovins Farm at North Newton until I insisted upon a site visit, which, which was the right and the common sense thing to do. Now, I think to get a true assessment of this and get a feeling of the whole job, the committee should go out there. By the time we get this organised, there may well be outside visits anyhow, from what I can say of it. And, uh, and I think it would be very, very beneficial because some of the some of the pictures, with the greatest respect to the planning officer, aren't very good. You know, I haven't got a I haven't got a microscope. Look at the aerial photos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some of the pictures you saw going going within doesn't doesn't probably represent the place. And and I do think a site visit would be very very beneficial. I'm talking from a, a farmer's point of view now. You do to be on you need to be on site for so many operations today. Ten minutes is too late sometimes. An hour is definitely too late. And. Uh, I know you have other members of the family that don't always work and very often mum and dad are getting older and they want to take a step back from the businesses and, and rely very much on their sons and daughters and probably the situation could be arising like this but uh, but I do feel that as a, as a local planning authority we hold a duty to take a site visit and take a look and not just throw the towel in just like that. Thank you Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, I'd, I've got to agree with um, Councillor Evans. I'd, I'm concerned to hear um, Mr. Brett's comments with regards to the his feeling that there's been a lack of communication between the planning the, the planning department and uh, themselves, um, and whether or not this is a COVID issue or whether or not because there's been various plans and this is did they say it's a second application uh, has there not been enough time and with Mr Brett turning around and saying you know he's quite happy for this to be extended so all the information can be in and considered at the same time um I, I, I I'm not I, I think yes I think I'd, I'd have to support uh, Councillor Revan's honour to fill Thank you. I think just from from my own point of view, I think one of the things we is is difficult here for members is is that we're the application we're obviously dealing with is is for the is for the the bungalow that's being proposed. We're not looking at the the tourism business in in itself. We're looking at that as a slight aside. I think certainly I I can have a lot of sympathy with with where Councillor Evans is, and I think from the feeling of members and the speakers there is a great deal of enthusiasm for seeing this business grow. And if there is a way of making that happen, then we, we want to be looking at that. I think the feeling I got from, from the case officer was that there may well be potentially even other buildings on site that could be converted as a barn conversion that might be able to meet this demand. Um, and as, as Councillor Evans said, unfortunately at the moment, we don't have all the information to be able to make a positive decision. But I can see that, that as members, we're, we're we're not very keen to make an, an, a negative decision and simply say no to this. And I, I wonder whether deferral may be a, a way that we're looking at. But um, I'll be coming to officers in just a minute. I do still have a couple of members who are indicating to speak, and that is councillors Granter and Pierce. So, Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Titchener for his in depth presentation. Uh, we have an application here that. Uh, at the moment has three dwellings already on, on the site and we have 30 units on site six with planning permission so we're making this application with for six units with planning applications so i think what is on site at the moment with the existing planning is, is adequate now I don't know when we're going to pick up the rest of the other units until they do pick up the other planning permission for the other 24 units, then it'll be a different, it'll put this in a different light. But I think that our officer ha, ha, has done very well with this application and, uh, and at the moment it doesn't, in my mind, warrant any, any more any more workers on this site but 
if anything else changes with the units, then, then like I said, it's a different matter. Thank you. I've got Mr Noon wanted to come in, but I've also then after that, I've got councillors Pierce, Gibson, Murphy, Bradford and then Hendry. So Mr Noon. Yes, thank you. I think um, I was really going to sort of just underline the points that uh, Councillor Grant had just made in that in terms of the case officer's consideration of this application, he you know, whilst you know, there are a number of sort of technical loose ends that Mr. Brett has pointed out and wanted some time to deal with, the fundamental issue that he was faced with in, in looking assessing the application is that there are only six lawful units of holiday accommodation plus the agricultural activities alongside a request for a fourth dwelling. And at that point, it, it's all fairly clear in our minds in terms of an assessment against policy that we were struggling with a justification for this unit on site. Now, obviously, if we go for a, a deferral, um, then we could you know, um, look at time to regularise everything else, which may or may not be supported. Um, I would hope we would support it, but you know, we, we haven't you know, seen the detail of that application yet. We may well sort of deal with the issues surrounding the, the eco possible ecological impact. I think even then we still do have some issues about the functional case for a fourth dwelling on site. We probably also have these issues of location, which again the site visit members may come to a, a view on, but we do, we've always felt with this one, the functional need, if there is one, would be better served nearer the activities that it is there to oversee. Um, you know, and it may well be we resolve those. So I think just think if we are going down a deferral, I think just all members to give us a steer um, as to what issues they are identifying with the application, and we will do our best to work our way through those issues. Um, but our, our, our view, in, I know with all respect to the agent on this one, um, we did feel that this one had so much, you know, that many problems with it. We thought we, you know, only fair just to present it at this point in time. Um, members can you know give us and the agent a clear steer on what the issues are, either with going with their officer recommendation or by deferring it um, with instructions of what needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Mrs. Debris indicating. Thank you. Um, I think I was just going to highlight to members in terms of the reasons for refusal that have been put forward, because if um, members are minded to go for a refusal or if they are minded to go against the officer recommendation, it's just to have a look at them and make sure they're satisfied that they can be overcome. Um, so the first one in terms of principle, I think just highlights on um, what Mr Noon sort of um, gone through in terms of the lack of information we've got at the moment with the functional need, because we can only consider, consider the authorised development. So um, the original application when it was submitted was for an agricultural workers dwelling but the justification was in connection with the tourism business, which is why the first application was withdrawn. Um, the second application obviously has been resubmitted, but unfortunately the tourism business in, in its whole still hasn't yet been regularised. So if the use of the additional dwelling is in connection with the tourist use and members are looking at a deferral, I think the deferral would have to be a very long deferral to allow for the appropriate assessment of the tourism expansion as it's happened and then subject to a favourable outcome on that then we would go back to looking at the agriculture business and the tourism business and whether combined they need four dwellings on site for four workers to be on site 24 7 which officers have raised through the presentation in terms of there being some concern about that um, we would also need to look at marketing of um, other sites available within the vicinity and look at potential conversion opportunities within the site, all of which haven't been demonstrated as part of this application. Um, in terms of siting and design, um, obviously a site visit may give you a better indication on that, but I would suggest it wouldn't address the first reason. Um, and the third reason is insufficient information in terms of the appropriate report. So again, a site visit wouldn't address the ecology issue that's that's been flagged by the the third reason for refusal but if members can bear those in mind with the discussion going forward um just to make sure whatever recommendation we get to at the end of it um would be appropriate in terms of you having adequately considered everything that's put before you at the moment thank you thank you very much okay i'm just 
Right. I've just been corrected, Councillor Revens. Uh, yes, you're sec you, th there has been a proposal for a deferral and that has been seconded by Councillor Bolt. Um, so that is what's on the, the, the table at the moment. Um, uh, uh, thank you for clarifying, Mr Chairman. I, I, I heard him say support, but I didn't say hear him say second. And I that's, wasn't that's, clear. That's where I thought I was, but I've had I've been corrected by the uh, committee manager. So um, so it has been it has been seconded officially. So I've got a number of members who are are speaking. What I will do, Councillor Evans, is obviously come back to you for for a bit of it more detail on on the reasons for that deferral and the guidance that obviously the, the officers were seeking as to if we defer it, what it is that we're seeking for the applicant to provide us to enable us to make a a more informed decision. But I do have a number of members who've asked to speak, which is councillors Pierce, Gibson, Murphy, Bradford, Hendry and Grimes. So we'll start with councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I apologise for missing the first two applications, but I have heard this one in its entirety. Um, just, well, the, I think the, the past um, three speakers have really covered what I was uh, planning to say in that I, I do have concerns about being asked to make a decision on the basis of a business which doesn't yet legally exist. And I'm struggling to um, to understand that the functional need as things stand and the ecologist report is very is very straightforward in in the objection. So it's not that I, you know, don't wish this business to succeed, but I just wish that they put the applications through in the right order so that we could make a sequential dis dis decision. Um, so on the basis of the information so far, I would struggle to support uh, deferment and would um, support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I uh, agree with Councillor Pierce and Councillor Grant and some of the other points that have been made, but I think the location for this is in the wrong place. Um, I think that uh, that uh, the conversion of a barn or some other building on the site should be looked at and the building should be nearer the main farmhouse. I think it's uh, too far away from there. I think that, that really you should be looking at the relationship with the village, uh, where, the, um, where this uh, potential new build would be uh, in relationship to the village form. Um, for that to occur. Um, so I would, I mean, first of all, I thought maybe extending the house, but that's been said that 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 will that probably wouldn't be wanted. But I would look at um, a barn conversion and um, yeah, on, on ecology, I just don't, uh, I would, I would support the officer's recommendation for this. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yes. Um, I'm not struggling to understand this at all. I, I find it absolutely incredible that this gent one of the gentlemen came along and said, admitted that they had expanded exponentially. And I think they have expanded exponentially without tidying up along the way. And I think I think the the, the officer's presentation was absolutely spot on. He spent a long time analyzing the number of people on site who could do all the jobs, especially the jobs for those unlawfully established items and I think I think the applicant is totally wrong in coming forward to this committee with an unfinished uh, situation an unlawful situation he, we are not here to deal with uh, uh, half-baked uh, applications which part of which are unlawful I mean by the very nature of that we shouldn't be dealing with that so as far as I'm concerned I also think the the officer talked about ramp personally I think there's been a wonderful, yes, wonderful, but rampant expansion without permission. There's been a, there's been, we talked about Christmas trees, we talked about um, vines, we talked about a wine tasting, we talked, they've obviously had all these set around the table with all these wonderful ideas, which is totally admirable, especially during the COVID times, lockdown and farms needing to diversify. And I congratulate them on that. But they're doing that on a rocky foundation, which the, which the officer has described as, we have problems with the principle of development here. And I think we also have problems with the bungle of positioning and design. I mean, you know, these are facts that are coming out where there, there are opinions by an officer, but they are 
they are real things that matter to him and to matter to our planning procedures. So I have to say to you that I would have absolutely no no hesitation in supporting the officer in refusing this application. Thank you no. very much. C Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, have I got no support at all for a site visit? Because this is this is a big old area. And, and to people to visit, they could get a general feeling of the place. I think they could personally, and they can look around, they could see barns that may be converted or, or become for better use. And, and the ANOB has been brought in. You can show close the hills are to maybe the, the, the site that was talked about. You can see the footpaths and everything else. You can't always do these things from an office desk, shuffling about paper, and there's too much of that done. And in the last year, 15 months, we've seen examples of an awful lot of it. Because the eye, the eye just lets just sets up so much sometimes, and you could defer it. I don't, how long are you going to defer it for? You could defer it for a while, quite a period of time, where things are going on. You know, things might just might change. And, and you know, and, and, and I'd still like a bit of bit of support for uh, for a site visit. I really would. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've got Councillor Hendry next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm actually going to withdraw from speaking at the moment. That's why I've undone my message there. This, this conversation is getting very complicated, so I'm happy to listen to what everybody else is saying. But thank you, Arlie. OK, Councillor Grimes. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think sometimes we're getting away from the issue. Um, I don't see the relevance in a site visit for the for the simple reason is that the issue is, as been said by Councillor Granter, I think he summed it up very well. We're asked to look at a at, at um, an application which has hasn't actually got planning permission, and there's too many there's too many ifs, buts, and maybes. And I think if planning permission was uh, granted to this, and and it came back we would be looking at a business that was legitimate and it actually um, could show that they need the extra bodies on, on this farm to make it pay. So I'm just not happy with how it's going. I don't think all the information is, and I think it was very foolhardy to bring this application through without all the relevant um, documents being sorted out beforehand. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, I totally agree with what's just been said, and I was going to say something similar, because I think there's too many loose ends um, at this um, with this application, and the officer has presented it in a very um, concise way. Um, I would like to actually move the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you. I I would like to second Councillor Scott's recommendation, please, of accepting the officer's recommendation until we have we have to turn this down and tell the applicants to go back and and get something sorted a lot better than they put in with this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I've got Councillor Grimes. I was going to do the same, Chairman, so uh, I have nothing to say further. Thank you. OK. So just just to confirm, I think where if, if we can just solidify where we are, uh, my understanding is we have a recommendation that was moved and seconded by Councillor Revens and Councillor Bolt, which was for a a deferral. And I believe Councillor Revens, you're you're saying that was also that as part of that deferral, at some point there would need to be a site visit. Uh, um, that's that. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. I I I, I tagged it into a, a a joke about the wine the wine tasting facility, but it was actually a serious proposal. Okay, and just to confirm, that's what you were seconding, Councillor Bolt. That's that's what I understood. Yes. Okay, so that has been moved and and seconded. We ha also have a proposal for the officer's recommendation, which is a refusal, was to be moved and seconded. But obviously, we would have to take the first one first, which is is Councillor Revens's proposal. Uh, obviously, if, if members wish to go for the alternative, then they have to vote 
the appropriate way on the first vote for the second vote to take place. Uh, if, if members are clear. I have Mrs Lehman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just um, clarification on um, Councillor Reverend's um, motion. Um, he asked for deferral for further information. Um, how long is the deferral? How long um, a deferral is he requesting, and what information is he seeking, please? Okay, Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I would struggle to put a time limit on it because there are, uh, I think, six points I would like clarification on. The first is to regularise uh, the units that don't have permission to provide an analysis of the functional need uh, to receive a landscape assessment of the impact of this development, to receive the ecology report, uh, to receive a report on the impact on nearby heritage assets and to address concerns about the design and location of the bungalow and the reason for the site visit is to appreciate the impact on landscape and to appreciate the functional need um, by location. I've got Mrs De Vries. Thank you. Um, I was going to say three months, but listening to the list of additional information that uh, Councillor Evans is is interested in, it, it might be more reasonable to say three to nine months because um, ecology reports need to be undertaken at certain times of the year. Um, so it, it's a very long deferral if, if members are looking to vote for a deferral. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be guided by uh, Mr. Fries's expertise there. And again, Councillor Evans, one of the issues that was raised uh, was uh, you've mentioned design that there was discussion. I think the officers raised the issue about whether there were other buildings on site that might be appropriate for for use. Is that to be encompassed in within that? Uh, indeed, that's what I that's um, what I was trying to get to when I mentioned the location of the building, um, whether whether an alternative location, including a conversion of one of the barns, might be a an outcome that would be acceptable. And if I can come back to Mrs. De Vries and Mrs. Lehman just to confirm, are you are you happy that you understand what is being asked for and that that, that is is a is a is a reasonable recommendation for for the committee to make? Um, if I can come back first, I, I understand yep. what's been asked for and why it's been asked for. Um, my one hesitance in it is obviously the red outline for this application is specifically the access road going to the location that's proposed for the bungalow as before members at the moment. So in the event that the um, application needs to be moved or an alternative site is um, preferred, it would end up being a different application anyway. So it would have to be um, sort of resubmitted as a fresh application with a different red outline. We can't consider that as part of this application in the event there's an alternative site. If they can justify the site they've currently outlined, it would be the same scheme. But if they need to pick a different scheme, it's a different red outline. So it'd be a different application for members. Mrs. Lehman. I um, concur with um, Dawn de Vries's comments. I have nothing further to add. Thank you, Chairman. So, so again, if I am just trying to get clarification for members so we know what we're voting on, are, are you in effect saying that if if we're looking for all these things that could potentially change, that we're we're in effect saying it would be a different application that would be needed to be dealt with and that therefore we we can't we couldn't necessarily achieve that through the deferral i, yes. I just want to get clarity yeah. so that we all so know where we are for, for clarity the red outline submitted i don't know if um dean could you get up the red outline for the application site just in front of members so they can see the site location plan so we can defer the application we can ask for all the additional information we can wait until we've got consent for the tourist site so that we can see what functional need they can demonstrate in connection with the lawful use of the site. But the red outline for the application is this red outline here. So um, this shows the access into the site, down past all the buildings, and ultimately the development of this land parcel to the back. So the revised scheme, they would have to demonstrate that they could appropriately site a dwelling in this location under this application for it to be a deferral. If through gathering the information, an alternative site um, closer to the complex or you know conversion of one of the existing buildings 
the red outline would have to change. So it would have to be a different application that would be considered. Okay. Thank you. If I can just ask members, are there any comments or questions you have on the advice that we've just had for clarity before we come to a vote? I'm not seeing anything. Is there just to make sure that I wanted to double check? Nick Gibson's got her there hand There is a hand up. up, so I've got, yes, Councillor Gibson and then Councillor King, and we've both put hands up now. So, Councillor Gibson? Yeah, thanks. I, I think there's a delay on the hands and the messages at the moment. Thanks, uh, Councillor Filmer. No worries. Um, I, I, it just, especially when uh, Councillor Evans added the uh, looking at uh, alternative sites for the uh, accommodation uh, for the new build or the conversion, it, it changed to a different application. It, to me, it just sounds like gather that information and put in a new application. Um, uh, that's what it sounds like, and not not a defer, not not a reason to defer, really. Okay, and Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. I've got me hand working now. Um, yeah, well, I think if we're going to defer it for um, a new application, then, then maybe with they should consider putting in the uh, additional holiday accommodation they've got on site as well, so I, that it legalises the lot in one go. I will. And, Justify will, obviously the the use of a new build. Understood. I will just come back to Mr. De Vries, but my understanding from what the agent said is is that there is an application which is in the system pending registration, which does deal with those holiday accommodation issues. Yeah, my my understanding is there's an application been submitted. It's still going through the registration process for the um sort of unconsented tourist uses. So that is in hand, but it's a separate application that's being considered separately from this one. Okay. Councillor Hendry, you've indicated. Yes, Mr Chairman. There's a lot of talk about the the um, the hospitality units, ones that have got planning, ones that haven't. Surely we can't consider that. The only things we're allowed to talk about and consider is actually what's on the table before us at this moment in time. Once you start to go into the, ho the holiday units, you're going to deviate away from actually what's in front of us. Uh, secondly, if they had wanted a barn conversion, they would have asked for a barn conversion. That's that's not what the applicant wants. That's completely different issues. If you're going to build a two bedroom bungalow with ensuite bathrooms, you don't ask for a barn conversion. So to say to the applicant, well, go away and think about this and then come back to us. Is, is I, I just don't see that's absolutely pointless. If you want a bungalow, why, why would you ask for a barn conversion? And as we go back to the point again, we cannot deal with holiday units that have or have not got planning permission. It's what's here on the table today and the other things shouldn't even come into this. Thank you. I think just for, for I think again for clarification, the the issue of the holiday units is that the holiday units are partially being used to justify the need for the dwelling. And what's being said is we can't use Sorry. the holiday Daniel Mumby. <laughs> okay. We can't we can't use the Hang up or press cash for more options. Okay. I'm not going to hang up, but we'll carry on. Um, all I was going to say was the, the the issue of the holiday units, as I understand it, is simply that they're being used as a justification as part for okay. the need of this dwelling. If they're not lawfully in place, then we can't use them as a justification. That situation, by all accounts, may change in the future in that there is an application to see whether they will get lawful permission, but we can't assume that until that permission has been dealt with. So that's okay, that the complication, I think, on, on the holiday unit side of it at the moment. Okay, thank you for that. Having said that, we now come to a, uh, we'll need to come to the vote, which is initially on the deferral. And I just need to confirm that uh, Councillor Bolt has agreed to the, the, the recommendations as outlined by uh, Councillor Revens for the reasons for his deferral and the information that is being sought. Yes, no problem. OK, thank you for that. So we move to the vote and we'll start uh, this time with uh, uh, we'll start with Councillor Grimes. So we are voting on the recommendation for deferral as proposed by Councillor Revens and seconded by Councillor Bolt. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've seen and heard everything and I am against. OK, Councillor Perry. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard everything, and I am for. Councillor Bolt. Seen and heard everything, and I'm for. Councillor Bradford. I've seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman. I am for. 
Councillor Kingham. If you have any outside, you've seen and heard the whole debate, am I against? Councillor Revens. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I am for. Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy. Oh. Hello. Uh, oh. Can you yep, hear me, Mr Chairman? We can do now, Councillor Murphy. I'm very sorry about that. Yes, um, I'd just like to say I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm present throughout the presentation, Chairman, and I am against. Councillor Hendry. I have seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman, and I am against. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard everything and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Thank you. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you, Councillor Pearce. Uh, thank you. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you. And Councillor Granta. Yes, Chairman, thank you. Yes, I can confirm that I've heard and seen all of the, the debate and that I am against. Thank you. I've also seen and heard the whole debate and, and on this occasion I'm also against. So, Mrs Nicholson, is that all members have voted that? Ah, I'm sorry, I've, I've just been uh, highlighted that. Councillor Murphy, could you just confirm that you were present throughout the whole of the debate? If can. Apologies, Mr Chairman. Yes, I confirm I was present throughout the whole debate. That's right. Sorry, I didn't pick it up earlier. Um, Mr Nicholson, is that all members have voted? Yes, Chairman. Um, that's uh, for four support the proposal and 11 against. So that is clearly lost. Uh, so we move to the second vote, which is the recommendation from Councillor Scott seconded by Councillor Granta for uh, refusal. We'll start this time with uh, Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Again, Chairman, present throughout, Chairman, and I support the officer's recommendation. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, on this issue, I'm actually against the officer's recommendation. Thank you. OK, Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Thank you. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Pearce. Yes, I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Glassford. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Granta. Yes, Chairman, heard and seen all of the debate and I'm certainly for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Councillor Bolt. Seen and heard the whole debate and against. Councillor Bradford. Seen and heard the whole debate, Mr. Chairman, and I'm against. Councillor Kingham. Seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm against. Councillor Revens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seen and heard the whole debate, and my vote is against. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm for. Thank you. And I've also seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm also for. <laughs> So, Mr. Nicholson, is that all members have voted? Yes, Chairman. That's, um... Ten. Ten in support and five <clears throat> against. Could you just check that again, please? I've got a different number, but I don't know whether Mrs. Lehman has got a different figure. Here's Councillor Kingham voted against both proposals. 
that's correct. Yes. So it should be nine in support and six against. That's that's the same figure I've got. And Mr. Lehman, just to confirm. Yes, um, I can confirm that, Chairman. Thanks. Thank you very much. That is that is refused as per the recommendation, but obviously uh, the applicants and agent have heard the debate, and I'm sure they will be having further discussions with the uh, with the officers as to a uh, future of, of the site. That brings us to the end of that application. So members, if you move to our next application uh, where we are uh, moving to the parish of Wemden, uh, we're on page 36 and I believe Mrs De Vries, you're presenting this one. Thank you, Chairman. We can um, see your cover sheet. Perfect. Right, so the application before members is for Greenway Farm, um, five skimmer lane in Wemden. Um, it's for retention of um, three portable dining igloos, um, an additional two portable dining igloos um, and three wooden picnic benches in association with the existing restaurant cafe use at Greenway Farm. So the application is before members as Wemden Parish Council have objected on the application although they confirmed they would support subject to conditions which restricted the use of the lawn to the restaurant um, and not for private parties, restricting the hours um, and the lighting and limiting the consent for two years. Councillor Caswell also objected on the application on grounds of noise, antisocial behaviour, traffic and non-conformity of the site with historic planning conditions. Um, just as an update for members, there was an additional letter received from one of the neighbours um, between publication of the report and the committee. Um, it was raising concerns generally in the response from environmental health and the recommended conditions um, that they proposed. There's also amendments uh, proposed to conditions 10 and 11 to require the details of the landscape scheme and the details of the fencing to close off the existing access to be submitted within three months of the date of the decision. So it's just adding a trigger to those conditions. So in terms of location, um, the application site is located outside of the settlement boundary and accessed off Skimmerton Lane to the east of Greenway Garage. Um, there are two residential properties indicated on this slide by the blue stars. So there's one on the north side of Skimmerton Lane in this location here. Um, and one to the northeast, um, which is this property here. So this is the application site um, that's uh, seeking consent at the moment. There's also a property to the east of the restaurant. So this unit here is also a separate residential unit. Um, the application seeking consent to allow the siting of the um, external seating in connection with the existing restaurant use um, to be provided with five igloos and three picnic benches in this location here. So in terms of main considerations, we're going to have a look at principle of development, size and design, relative to scale and character of the distance surrounding area, impact on heritage assets, impact on the adjoining properties, highway considerations and impact on ecology. So this is the application site. Um, the location plan for the development shows the access off of the main th A39 which is to the southwest and Skimmerton Lane to the northwest and there's a car parking connection with the existing premises to the southwest of the building and the site proposed for the external seating area is to the north of the existing building. Um, the detached red area that's highlighted by the red arrow um, is an access that's been put in place that will be closed as part of this application due to concerns raised in respect of highway safety, because there's an exit um, from the Greenway Garage site in this location. So there was con some concerns um, regarding the conflict of the two accesses. In terms of context, um, the next few slides show some photographs of the site. So this is the existing access into the application um, site taken from Skimmerton Lane. And these are some views within the site looking northwest and north from the lawn area. Um, the roof line of the nearest residential property, um, you can just see over the boundary treatment um, in this location. And again, 
sort of through here. You'll note that the trees weren't in leaf at the time that I did the site visit for this site. Um, this is a view from the northwest corner looking north and northeast. Um, Bramble, so this area, this is Bramble that was cleared from the electricity pylon um, due to works on the pylon just before my site visit. Um, the boundary is proposed to have a 15 metre landscaping area which would provide a visual and noise buffer to the neighbouring property. The bottom image is a view from the grassed area looking south towards the existing restaurant. So this is the um, main existing restaurant and this is the separate unit um, adjoining the site. The top image is a view of the northeast corner of the site, um, which adjoins the rear boundary of the neighbouring property to the northeast. Um, if you can just note the uh, large tree, um, it comes back to another slide a little bit later. Um, and the below image is a view looking southeast, showing the existing post and rail boundary treatment that's long. So it's it's this edge and this edge that members can see in these photos. And um, just for an indication in terms of size and scale, this is an image of one of the igloos. Um, it was stored at the rear of the building when I undertook the site visit for this site. So the application is for five of these to be sited within the lawn area and three picnic benches. So in respect of principle, um, the site is located outside the settlement boundary, although policy um, C01 and C03 supports the reuse and remodelling of existing sites um, where it remains of an appropriate scale and character and would not result in a significant adverse impact. So policy D15 also states that retention, remodelling or appropriate expansion of existing buildings will be supported where it remains an appropriate scale and character dependent on the nature of activities involved and the character of the site and its accessibility. So in principle, the development can be supported by policy subject to local impacts. So officers raise no objection in terms of size and scale or location in terms of the visual impact of the site as it is currently well screened with the existing boundaries and the proposal is not considered to appear, um, sorry, the proposal is considered to appear as a natural extension to the existing use. Concerns were raised during um, the application regarding intensification of use um, and the visual impact on the historic road. Um, county highways have confirmed standing advice and given the nature of the development and the screening, there's not considered to be any heritage Im impact um, and there's no objection raised in terms of the intensification of the use um, in respect of highway safety uh, matters. Um, so as shown earlier on the slide, there are three residential properties in proximity to the site, um, one on the opposite side of the road um, and one to the northeast, located over 25 metres and 60 metres respectively, and an attached property to the east of the restaurant. Um, the application site includes a 10 to 15 metre um, landscape buffer to the front to ensure appropriate screening to the property opposite, and the landscaping is extended to the south to ensure the screening of the dwelling to the northeast. The attached dwelling already has an overview of this site and has not provided any sort of comment on the application. The five pods um, are shown on this plan in these locations. Um, and they are conditioned to be sited as per the plans and orientated to ensure that the doorway and the entrances are not facing the adjoining properties. Conditions are also proposed to limit the timing of the use of the outside seating area from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there are restrictions on lighting and external music. Subject to these, environmental health has raised no objection on the planning application. So this shows a view northeast and southwest along Skimmerton Lane, showing the two detached nearby properties. So the large tree in the earlier slide um, is on the right hand side of, of this image, uh, just giving members an idea in terms of uh, depth of the garden. Um, and the access to Greenway Farm is indicated on the bottom slide by the arrow here. So this is Skimmerton Lane, access into Greenway, and this is the property that's opposite. Um, the site has previously been subject to um, environmental health complaints in terms of noise and disruption. These were investigated as set out in the report and no evidence of statutory nuisance has been found. While seating in this location would result in a degree of noise to the neighbouring properties, the impact is proposed to be controlled and mitigated by condition. And given the economic benefits in supporting a local business and employment opportunity, 
the resultant harm is not considered sufficient enough to outweigh the planning benefits of the proposal. As such, um, officers are satisfied that the impact can be appropriately controlled by conditions um, which are listed at the end of the report. Some concern has also been raised in respect of ecology and potential impact on bats. Um, due to the nature of the existing site, um, just being laid to lawn, it's fairly limited in terms of biodiversity, um, but the additional landscape area would enhance this and given the limits on lighting and given the nature of the development as temporary structures, there's not considered to be any adverse impact. Um, prior to the application, uh, there was an access cleared and provided onto Skimmerton Lane. There were concerns raised during the application in terms of its position relative to the adjoining garage. And through this application, there is a requirement to close this access secured by condition 11. So this is just a photo showing the access and, and the proximity of the um, Greenway garage development and then the A road. So there were concerns opening up that as, a, as an additional point of access. So in conclusion, the principle of development um, is considered to be an appropriate expansion of an existing use within a countryside location and is supported by policies subject to localised impacts. Um, given the size and scale of the structures um, and the degree of screening, there's no objection raised in terms of size and design, um, and it's not considered to result on any wider impact in terms of the character of the wider area. Um, there were concerns raised in terms of potential impact on the historic um, roads, but given the screening and the temporary structures, they're not considered to result on any impact on the heritage assets. Um, impact on adjoining properties um, has been fully considered as set out in the report. And whilst the use of the area of lawn to the front of the building would result in some noise and disturbance to local residents, it's not considered that it would be so significant as to sustain a refusal in this case. Um, there's no objection raised in terms of highway um, concerns and, and in respect of ecology, the use is considered to result in an enhancement because of the additional landscaping. So the application is therefore before members recommended for conditional approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as you'll see, members, we've got a number of speakers on this application. So if we start with uh, Derek Perry, please, if you could turn on your microphone and just confirm that it's working for us, please. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, and again, just a reminder, you, you've got three minutes to address the committee and we should hear a, a bell when two minutes of that has, has gone. So please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Paragraph D25 says that of the policy says that development that will unacceptably impact upon residential amenity of nearby dwellings will not be supported. Particular consideration will be given to impacts on privacy, loss of light and noise or disturbance. There's huge community opposition from those who've experienced noise and disturbance from this party venue. Those detailed objections are compelling evidence on proper planning grounds of problems that will get worse if this succeeds. The officer's summary of objections can't do them justice, so please read each objection carefully, not just the summary. By contrast, those representations in support tend to come from people who don't live nearby and who may have attended events at the site. Their evidence base is tiny compared to residents. Anyway, it's easy to support this when you don't have to live with it. Mrs Lammercraft is 89. Her generation grins and bears rather than complains. She's lived in Sanford Cottage since 1956. She's perfectly reasonable and doesn't mind people having a good knees up in the right place. But when it's yards from her front window, it's no joke. Even when partying is confined, as it should be, to the back end of the farm, people still roll out drunk into Skimmerton Lane in the night, while cars and taxis skid on the gravel and shine headlights into her home. But last summer, when the igloos were in use on the front lawn, without permission, hence their removal in this retrospective application, it was unbearable. Mr and Mrs Stewart are sociable people. They're not NIMBYs, but for years their peace and privacy has also been spoiled by noise from this site. The report implies that all is OK because there's no proven statutory nuisance, but this is detached from reality. There's long been a condition that amplified music should not be discernible beyond the property boundary, yet the stewards have even been able to supply environmental health with playlists from events. Even residents of Wemden Village and as far away as Holford Road can hear the noise. Why would they say this if there isn't a problem? Reference to noise monitoring equipment being refused is out of context and unfair. The equipment didn't work when it was installed and left unattended in the stewards' house. What was needed was a comprehensive survey and site visit during an event. The planning and licensing history of this party venue is of an inch being given but a mile being taken. The applicants can't or don't comply with conditions and the capacity to, inf to enforce isn't there. They previously admitted losing control of guests at events. That's no comfort to their neighbours. The office notes 
the, the well, Office of notes that security and antisocial behaviour is a management issue which can't be regulated by planning. In a sense, that's the point. These are negative residential amenity issues which can't be managed. And so policy D25 militates for refusal. The proposed buffer zone is a SOP, not a solution. Hedges and trees will take years to grow and thicken out, and even then will be ineffective against the noise of revellers on the lawn. And why should the stewards have to live with overgrowth blocking evening sun from the west anyway? Pointing the igloo entrances towards the farmhouse is another pointless SOP. Revellers will congregate around them and around the picnic benches. It'll be a novelty beer garden, and there's no way that wedding guests can be penned off from other customers as the nights roll on. When restrictions end in June, it'll be open season. Imagine being at this venue on a summer Saturday night. Do you believe that you'd think to yourselves, I'd be happy living next to this? In applying policy D25, perhaps that's the key question. If you're not already minded to refuse, please don't approve without deferring for a site visit. And finally, in October 2017, the licensing panel decision said, it was the belief of the panel that the applicants had put the welfare of customers before the welfare of its neighbours, and that had to stop. Well, Mr. members, Perry, you'll be again. Have, sorry, yeah. I'm going to have to call time on you there, but thank, thank you, you very I'm much. Finished. Thank you. Just for, for future speakers, we seem to be having some issue with the uh, with with the, the hearing the bell. So what I will do for, for future speakers is I will just step in and, and say there's one minute to go so that you know that there's that time to go. So please don't feel that you've been interrupted, but I think for some reason, we can't seem to get the bell to, uh, to to come through today on the audio. Uh, the next speaker I've got registered is, is Mike Solomon. Is is Mike here? And if not, I believe Tony J may be stepping in for him. So if either Mike Solomon or Tony J could uh, enable their microphones. Hello, it's uh, it's Tony here. Um, I'll just give Mike another couple of seconds because uh, he may be available. OK. OK, I'll not hearing anything, Mr. So again, just to remind you, you've got the three minutes and, and, and I will just step in to say when there's one minute to go. OK, thank you. Good morning, Chairman, Councillors, and thank you for your time this morning. Let me start by thanking the officers for their thorough report and by saying that this planning application posed a real dilemma for our parish council. We obviously want to encourage the applicant to keep their business going but this, this does need to be managed in a manner that avoids disturbance, not only to their immediate neighbours, but also to the wider community along Wendon Hill and beyond. To this end, as a parish council, we felt that it would be better if the dining pods could have been retained in the rear garden, where the impact from noisy parties would have been shielded from the neighbours by the existing buildings. And I note that this has been referenced in passing in Dawn's report. Should this not be possible, then we asked that conditions be imposed that restricted the use of the benches and pods to avoid bookings by large parties and groups, which would inevitably lead to friendly but noisy exchanges. Even noisy goodbyes and the sound of cars leaving can be very disturbing late in the evening or even early in the evening if you have children. We do appreciate that there are many pubs and restaurants in the country as well as the town where noise impact on neighbours is inevitable. But I just ask you how you would react if this type of business activity was started up by your neighbour, one with whom you share a boundary and not just for an occasional garden party, which we would all accept. But this is a license for a garden party every night forever. We feel that under such circumstances, the positioning of the benches and the plastic dining pods should be reconsidered and that a far more effective sound barrier between the busy areas and the neighbours needs to be installed. Please remember that these plastic dining pods offer very little as a sound barrier, whatever the orientation of the doorway. We do appreciate that the planning team have accepted and included some of the conditions that were raised in our report. And thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Councillor Caswell. Councillor Caswell, can you enable your microphone, please? and Just confirm it's working again for us, please. I hope it's working, Chairman. Yep, you, we've got you loud and clear. So again, I'll I'll just step in if if you get to the point where there's a minute left to go, uh, and just let you know that that time is there. So please start when you're ready. Okay. Good morning again, Councillors. Um, well, here we are. A fantastic facility, wonderful food, and may I say I've enjoyed the fair at Greenway Farm, as I know many councillors have. Mr. Mrs. Felstead is the clerk of Spaxton Parish Council, which is in my ward, and it is extremely diligent in the way she conducts her business. 
as with all things so, especially dwellings in the country, unfortunately this comes this fantastic enterprise comes with responsibility. Noise and disturbance are the bane of such establishments, especially to the near neighbours and especially in the countryside. There are no background noise to to discern the, the to dissipate the the uh, loudness of music, people talking and everything like that. This is actually in the countryside, near to Bridgewater, near to Wemden, but it's actually in the countryside and noise travels further. I don't think personally there has been suf sufficient noise monitoring by our environmental health departments, nor enforcement by our planning department, which I know at the moment is, is quite difficult. But this has to be done and it has to be done before the permission is given for these pods, etc. We need to know, we have to have a baseline of what is there at the moment. Vehicles leaving the site after having a meal or attending a function will slam doors, say good night, but because of the location and disturbances, of, but will cause disturbance and to the surrounding area. And as far away as Wendon Hill and Alford Road, I've had complaints from both those areas myself. One minute to go. Thank you. I would suggest that we really do need to have a full noise survey, and this has to be carried out before any consideration is given to these pods or anything like that. I must admit, it is a wonderful facility, and the, and the food is tremendous, and I recommend it to you, but it has to come with some responsibility. The Felsteads are not responsible for the noise that people make, but they can help to mitigate it. And I've advised them to do that. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, our final speaker is, is Sue Felstead. If you could enable your microphone, please, and just confirm it's working for us. Is that working OK? Yep, we can hear you loud and clear. So again, you've got the three minutes and I'll I'll just step in to let you know when there's one minute of that time left to go. Yeah, just to say I'm going to leave my um, video off because broadband signal here is terrible. That's fine. I think it no, might help. OK, no problem. thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologise for the retrospective nature of this application, which is born more from ignorance than anything else. As a parish clerk, I thought that um, temporary structures did not require planning. I was mistaken. Greenway Farms secured planning consent for a full-time restaurant operation in late 2019 and planned to open fully at Easter 2020. Obviously, the pandemic put paid to those plans. Being a small and adaptable family business, we changed course quickly to offer delivered and takeaway meals across a five mile radius, which for the next three months generated sufficient cash flow to keep our business going. When restrictions were eased in June 2020, the demand for takeaways all but disappeared as people welcomed the opportunity to venture out to restaurants again. Not everyone felt confident doing so, however, and there was the added complication of whether or not the government would permit hospitality to open indoor spaces, meaning we risked having to cancel bookings and waste food on days when the weather prevented outdoor dining. We therefore started researching possible solutions and initially hit upon the idea of putting up gazebos on our front lawn. As you will have seen from the plans, this is a substantial area of approximately 160 square metres, with the proposed location of the gazebos being some 25 or more metres from the nearest house. In the end, we felt that the igloos were more appealing and are also highly practical, lightweight, movable and weather resistant. Each measures 3.6 metres in diameter and takes up to six people. Given the size of the lawn, these can easily be located some considerable distance from neighbouring properties. Whilst in the event government permitted pubs and restaurants to also open inside areas, many people remained nervous about mixing in larger groups and social distancing measures more than halved our capacity. One minute the, ago. the igloos mitigated this. They became booked up months in advance, both as a COVID safe place and for novelty value, 
and we believe they're exactly the sort of investment to which the funding from government and Sedgemoor was intended to be put. The majority of representations against this application come from individuals who've never visited or seen Greenway and of course they're entitled to their view but they do not express them from first-hand knowledge. Those who support the application are local customers who know that this is not a party venue, this is a restaurant where most, part, uh, most customers are mature, respectful people wanting only to enjoy a nice meal in convivial company. The allegations of noise complaints date back to 2012-2013 and there have been none since. Also be borne in mind that the ambient noise in the neighbourhood ha has increased with Hinkley Point traffic and the redevelopment of Greenway Garage. I'm going to have to call time on you there, Mrs. Felster, but thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Uh, Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. I'll um I'll kick off. Can I? I'm just slightly confused. Um, some. Sanford Cottage has been mentioned, but on one slide, and I think it was slide seven, there was mention of an Apple Barn Cottage. Yeah. Um, could, could we just clarify, is this a separate, is Apple Barn Cottage, does that Apple, adjoin Greenway yes. Farm? Yes. And so that is a semi-detached property. Yes. And so the proposed pods are directly in front of that property too. Um, I... my own, yeah, the Apple Barn Cottage is, um, to my understanding, rented out separately, so it's still within the ownership of the applicant, but it's outside the application site, um, and there haven't ever been any concerns or complaints received from this unit. Um, it's been sort of wider properties that have raised concern with the site. Right, OK. OK, thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I I do have some concerns ab about this and the impact on on the neighbours and the, the evidence given and 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 the bit the business model of plastic pods in you know in the middle of a summer I I it's hard to to understand that people would stay in those pods or or be shouting to each other as has been um, mentioned but anyway I will listen to the rest of the uh, left rest of the debate but thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Any other members got any questions or comments, please? Uh, yep, hold on just one minute. I've got Councillor Perry and then Councillor Bolt and then Councillor oh, Gibson. OK. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Um, there was a mention um, that uh, the residents were well, not OK, but can it not be moved to the to behind Greenway Farm? Is there land available that they could move it to, to the rear of the property at all? Thank you. Is it Grace? Yeah, I mean, the application that is before members and that has been submitted to the planning authorities is for the area of land to the front. Um, with the red and blue outline, the blue outline does show the extent of ownership. So they do own a lot of land to the side and to the back, um, but we have to assess the area that they've submitted which is to the front of the building so that's the application that's before members at the moment that we've assessed as part of the application thank you i've got mr noon indicating yes just by way of clarification as the case officer who dealt with the most recent application prior to this for the the restaurant use the restaurant is operating um, in that sort of, I suppose, uh, the top sort of northeast corner of the building and the conservatory. So that's the approved restaurant use in there. So you can see from that point of view, this is where they, the easy place to take the food out to, to outside diners, which is why my understanding is they are here. Thank you. Councillor Perry, was there anything else on that one? Sorry, no, no, no but okay. it looked it looked like the car park parking area is reasonably close to um, the rear of the property. It looks a, a bit a bit better positioned. Thank you. I've got councillors Bolt, Gibson, Kingham, and Hendry. So, Councillor Bolt. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, 
you're speaking Councillor Bolt, if I could just check, could you check your mic? It's a little bit faint. Yeah, I'm back with it now. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. You, the, there's reference to um, this screening, et cetera, and um, X amount of metres away. How long is this screening? Um, it, I gather it's got to be grown. It isn't um, going to be as substantial trees and, and shrubs put in immediately. How long is that going to take before it's going to have any effect? Mrs. Debris? The boundary to the front, I think um, members would have seen from the site photos, there is currently quite an established landscape screen along the front and, and around the side, but the condition requires the landscape scheme to be submitted within three months of the date of the decision. Um, and due to what we're looking um, to secure through the landscaping, we would be looking at semi-mature um, sort of species going in, and then they'd be going in in the first planting season um, following approval of the landscape scheme. If, and thank you for that. There was also a reference to something in 2017. Um, I think it was made by Mr. Perry. Um, uh, there, there was some sort of decision made then. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I've missed exactly what was said, but is that part of this application? Not quite. Um, there's a number of applications that run alongside this site, but they've been licensing applications in connection with the restaurant and in connection with the use of the site as a wedding venue, um, which is where a lot of the um, environmental health complaints have come from in terms of the use of the site as a wedding venue and, and sort of noise and disruption concerns as a result of that use. Um, in terms of planning, um, the history is set out in the report, but it does say um, they had uh, permission for um, an agricultural building to um, a sort of D2 use, which does cover the wedding element of it. And they were um, operating weddings on the site under the um, temporary use of land permitted development rights. So again, it's something that's authorised through permitted development, so not something that planning necessarily got involved in. In terms of the noise because that is the biggest issue for the neighbours and, and has been um, quite a detailed element for assessment for this application. There have been um, sort of generally two complainants for this site um, raising concerns over 15 different occasions. Um, predominantly it's been linked um, with the weddings um, although there was concern raised from the pods, pods um, early 2020 um, but obviously then with the closure of the site um, due to COVID and, and sort of the diversification of it going to takeaways, um, there was no evidence to support um, the concerns raised in that respect. But these these complaints for 2015 um, and 13 were linked with wedding um, operations and the use of the site as a wedding venue. Um, and in terms of the history for environmental um, complaint, there was equipment installed in 2013 the noise from this was assessed and it wasn't considered there was a breach. Again, there was um, equipment um, sort of recommended in 2015 um, and then there's been limited records of noise disturbance. And if environmental health are looking into it in terms of statutory nuisance, it has to be evidence based and it has to be confirmed through the evidence base that there's a statutory nuisance. In the event there ends up being a statutory nuisance, if if that was confirmed for the site, there are then measures that need to be undertaken to address that statutory nuisance through environmental health. So um, we as, as planning officers, we're, we're relatively comfortable with the recommendation that we've put forward and the conditions we're proposing and that there would be a route to address noise issues if they got to the point where they were causing a statutory nuisance through other legislation. So, with the, and there is also a reference to um, the uh, the owners, the applicants, having lost control of uh, a, an incident out there. Um, is there any background to that? And does that count in, within the, the planning or is that a licensing issue? Um, there's there's a bit of a crossover depending on what what it is. My understanding was that was a wedding event, so it would have been licensing. Um, but in, um, the enforcement team are also um, helping assess these. I think my presentation appears to have ended, so I'll just represent. Okay, 
Is there anything further you wish to say, Mrs. De Vries or Ms. Councillor Bolt? Not at the moment, Tom. OK, thank you. Councillor Gibson? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I don't think, I think that another area, if they've got a lot of land around this area, I think another area should be looked at, not that front lawn. That's obviously very a problem um, for a start. And I would probably turn it down just from the fact that they were plastic pods going on there. I don't understand why they need them at all. And uh, it would only, uh, plastic pods only make more noise, uh, makes noise travel. Um, and I would put in something more substantial if they if they wanted some sort of structures in the in the garden. I guess they've done it because it's cheaper uh, to do that. I, I would want to turn this down just for the fact that there were plastic pods in the garden and what they would look like. But I would look for you know somewhere else to put something if they needed something more substantial to go in to cover people dining in in the garden. Mrs. Debris. Um, the application that's in front of members is, is for members to assess. The, there was a photo shared as part of the presentation in terms of what the pods look like. Um, so it's that. So it's, it's basically a frame uh, covered in plastic. Um, it was proposed to try and address sort of COVID limitations and help support the business um, to continue during the lockdown uh, periods. Um, but it will be for members to assess. Thank you. Could I ask one further question on the on the pods themselves? I think in condition six, we we were asking that they be located so that the entrances face towards the towards the building rather than towards the neighbours. Could I just confirm as to whether there's any in terms of the noise containment of the of the pods? Uh, obviously, they are just a what looks like a plastic sheet. Uh, do we have any information as to how soundproof those are in terms of any impact as to which direction that entrance faces or whether it, it's actually going to permeate anyway? Um, we don't have any um, noise assessment details in connection with the structures. OK, thank you. I've got councillors, uh, Councillor Kingham next, please, and then Hendry and I think Councillor Evans. So Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, like I'm just, I can sympathise with the uh, with the applicants, obviously, they're trying to keep their business going. Um, but unfortunately, most of the speakers, apart from their own today, have obviously, it's to do with noise and noise and disturbance that uh, people tend to be more aware of that. I understand that, um, as um, Mr. Perry stated out, um, the planting of trees along the front, which will help alleviate some of the noise but of course it again it takes away the light from the houses opposite side of the road it is a very difficult situation here but um i can't obviously go along with the recommendation at the moment and can the officer explain to me with their recommendation seven not quite sure what um what is meant by that Uh, Mrs. Devridge, we're talking about condition number seven, are we? No, that's right, Chairman. Yeah. yeah. I was trying um, to work out work out the hours. That was. We can't hear you, Mrs. Devries. Apologies, having fun and games with the computer today. Um, condition seven was um, just looking at limiting the use of the outside seating area. So um, it wouldn't be able to be used before 10 o'clock in the morning and it wouldn't be able to be used after 10 o'clock at night. So that was to try and restrict sort of any late night disturbance that could reasonably impact on the neighbours. So it's, it's limited use 10 till 10. Right, OK. OK, Councillor yeah. Hendry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In today's world, in the times of COVID, it's a very, very funny place to be, and so many businesses have gone to the wall and gone down. Other businesses, like, for example, Greenway Farm, are trying their very, very, very best to continue and thrive and do what they're doing. Uh, to go from, I think it's from three pods to five, could be indicative of, of what's to come, maybe, and maybe if they want to increase that in the future, but that's not what's on the table here before, is only considering these five and the tables. If they're going to go from, from 10 till 10, they've obviously had to consider the neighbours, they're doing that. Uh, the noise 
I, I just don't believe it would be that bad because there's a screen of trees that it could carry across the road and be so horrible to everybody. I do understand they may have concerns because it's an elderly lady, all this comes into play. And yes, there could be a little bit of noise, but you expect that from anywhere now. Even even if you got a Tesco's car park next to you, there's still noise of lorries coming and going. Greenway Farm itself has set itself up. The car park is situated perfectly. It's a very, very short stroll to go around the corner to where, all, where everything happens. Uh, the, the food, where it has to go out from, is in exactly the same area. It would be unrealistic to ask these people to consider this to go to the back. It's just, it's, it's just a, a silly consideration. Everything on the table that's here in front of you today is actually accept, acceptable for so many reasons. And as it stands, I've got no problem with this at all. I, and on that basis, I would like to put forward the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Revens and then Councillor Scott. Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've heard these described as temporary structures, but of course we're giving these temporary structures permanent approval, as I understand it, from this planning application. And I have to say, you know, like Councillor Gibson, I don't don't think you like having lots of plastic sheeting as being a material that we would use in the street scene. Um, I'm also struck by the comments of neighbouring properties and I look, I read policy D25 and it talks about unacceptable noise or disturbance and clearly the noise and disturbance that is coming from here has been unacceptable on various occasions. Clearly the uh, level of disturbance under planning law is different from that under environmental health law um, and I think that the, the hurdles are different as I understand it and I would welcome officer comment on this that what is actionable by environmental health may well be different than the disturbance that we would take as being unacceptable under policy D25. So I'd be interested to hear officers comments on those two points, please. Sister Reyes. Thank you. Um, if if I just go back to a point earlier in terms of materials and plastic, um, obviously that there was the photo um, shown to members in terms of the finish. Uh, I would assume the concern would be if the plastic gets to the point where it looks tatty or flaps about in the wind or, or anything like that, if you're running a successful business with a restaurant, you're wanting to keep everything to a high quality finish. Um, in any case, if there are issues with it, they are temporary, so they can be relocated, moved, um, fixed and sort of replaced um, as temporary structures. So um, it is a permanent consent. It's a permanent consent for the use of that area of lawn to place five dining pods and three picnic tables. So it is a permanent consent, but not necessarily for those specific five units because if they become damaged or, or need repair that can be undertaken under the planning permission. Um, in terms of noise, um, just going back to a slightly earlier point, in terms of noise and um, how long it may or may not take landscaping to establish, if members were concerned about that, um, there is something, there is attenuation, um, sort of noise attenuation fencing. So if members were so minded, they could um, sort of suggest an additional condition for an attenuation fence. Um, I would suggest behind the 10 metre buffer, but in front of the 5 metre buffer within the site, but that would be for members to consider um, and recommend. And I think in terms of the final point that Councillor Revens raised in terms of the difference between um, community impact um, under D25 and a statutory nuisance, um, a statutory nuisance, the noise does have to be um, in my opinion, worse, because it does have to prove that it's um, to such an extent it, it breaches and, and is sort of defined as a statutory nuisance and it has to happen over a number of occasions. Um, that said, for this site, it's been in connection with the operation of the venue as a wedding venue when you can expect, you know, late night events going on till late hours with live music, quite loud. Um, this application is for the use of the front lawn for a number of seating areas. So it's it's five pods and three picnic tables. So there would be a degree of 
um, perhaps overhearing certain conversations uh, between sort of this site and neighbouring residents. But I, I still don't consider that that would be to an extent that you'd refuse it on um, poor amenity impact on the neighbouring properties. But I know Adrian's um, sort of flagging to to come in. So if I can pass to Adrian, if that's acceptable, thank you. Yep, Mr. Noon. Yes, I was just the point I I was going to make um, in response to Councillor Revens. Um, there are two levels of amenity that we are entitled to consider here or have a bearing on our consideration. Firstly, our straightforward planning policies in terms of policy uh, policies D24 and D25 residential amenity. There is a level of harm there in planning terms that may fall short of statutory nuisance under environmental health legislation that might trigger a, a refusal on amenity grounds. It doesn't have to be a statutory nuisance for us in planning terms to refuse on residential amenity grounds. It's a more of a planning judgment in there. Our view here is that subject to the conditions, this application passes the amenity tests in planning terms through the application of policies D24, protection from pollution to noise, and D25 in terms of an adequate standard of amenity for the existing residents nearby. So we're at that lower level. We're saying it passes that test with the conditions we are suggesting. At that point, if we you know, do approve it, there is still the backstop in environmental legislation uh, in relation to statutory noise. But that is a high, that's probably a higher level of noise than a planning amenity test would require you to assess. We think it is met on that point. And just one other thing that uh, just reading condition seven, I think um, the hours, it really would read better if it's 10 to 2200 hours rather than and. I think that probably led to the confusion that a member identified in the reading of condition seven. So just change that to two. Um, so from 10 till two is your uh, 10 till 2200 is your permitted hours. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Thank you. Yeah, I think it comes down to what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And we don't know without seeing these plastic pods and ex and seeing what the level of conversation would be in one which makes it a very difficult judgment i'm not sure whether that qualifies as a site visit to to assess whether they would have an amenity impact on the neighbors or not i'm not quite sure how that would work in terms of being able to judge a a boisterous conversation in one of these pods how far it could be heard and so on. I I take on on board Mr. Freeze's point about they wouldn't want the pods to deteriorate to such a point that it would impact on on the business. I think my my point is that I think even brand new, I don't like the look of them, but that's maybe a ma matter of personal taste. And I, I, I wish we could build things not in, in plastic in this day and age. Thank you. Uh, I've got councillors Scott, Bolt, Bradford and then Gibson. So councillor Scott. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is quite difficult, isn't it? Because in current situation with COVID, you can see that a temporary sort of solution for their restaurant is to have sort of outdoor space and make it more, you know, workable for them and appreciate that. Um, but because we're giving a permanent um, solution here, and I understand that this permanent solution of what is um, the application of plastic pods, if it could actually become a permanent solution of a different kind of pod in the future. Um, I just wonder if the officer could confirm that. And also um, the current uh, restaurant, presumably it has um, hours of working at the moment. Could um, somebody confirm those? Because I could see that you could sort of intermingle both, which would um, lead to there being people, a lot more people there later at night. I'd just like those answers first. Thank Mr. you. Debris. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the application is for the pods um, as sort of shown on the plans and as shown in the photographs for members. Um, if they were looking to replace those with permanent structures, they would require consent in their own rights. Um, so 
yes, it's for the sighting of pods, but it's for the sighting of the temporary pods as currently before members. Um, in terms of the restaurant, I think they're licensed till about 11. So you could potentially um, be out in the garden until 10 and then relocate inside to the restaurant for the last hour if you wish to. But um, for the planning condition, whilst the planning condition is tighter than the licensing hours, it's ultimately the tightest time restriction bites on the site. So for the use of the outside area, they'd be limited till 10 o'clock at night. Councillor Scott. Is that currently enforced at the moment? With Because presumably people can go to a restaurant and they can go outside if they wanted to. <laughs> Yeah, at the moment, government advice is to not really enforce against businesses in the current climate because everyone is trying to recover from um, quite an economic, economically difficult situation. Um, the reason behind this application is the area of lawn to the front has never been used in connection with the restaurant. So the reason the application's in is to authorise the area of lawn to the front for use. Um, but at the moment, under government guidance, um, lots of pubs and restaurants can put up temporary structures without needing planning permission, but they need to be in authorised areas to be able to do that. No. Thank okay. you. Councillor Bolt. Yes, part of what I was um, going on was going to raise about the, the timing. Um, something that was raised um, by uh, Councillor Revens with regards to D25 and then it, it goes on that the environmental issues would have to be far worse. Should we be actually <laughs> passing something without knowing, uh, without having any, um, as I think Councillor Caswell referred to, any baseline to, to, to gauge it by, um, which, you know, we could be passing something which has then got to be enforced by a, 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 another department. Um, it, it just seems under D25, it's quite clear noise and disturbance um, and also the living conditions of future residents because all right, there's, there's older people living in these houses now, um, but should it go to a young family, we, we've got to address that um, where, you know, the, the, the noise levels at any time of the day could cause more disruption. I think under D25, there's there's a lot more to be answered than, than what's been covered here. Mr. Tabriz, do you want to come back? And I see Mr. Noon is also indicating. Yeah, so just under policy D25, you know, we do have to make an assessment as to whether the noise from this site would cause an immediacy issue to the neighbours. Um, in, in the case where we've got planning applications for industrial uses, um, you know, agricultural machinery, industrial machinery, we often want noise reports to be able to understand what the scale and degree of noise would be for that type of use. For, for this proposal, it's a number of outside seating areas for people to sit in connection with a restaurant and have a meal. So knowing the noise that people make when they sit outside eating and drinking, it's, it's general people noise of chatting conversations, clinking of glasses, that type of noise times how many seating areas you've got. So based on the type of use, we were generally comfortable with the information we've got in um, for the proposal that we can make a generalised assessment in terms of amenity level for neighbouring properties um, under policy D25. And I know the focus has been on D25 because that's where the issue is in terms of noise of neighbours, but in terms of making the planning application, we do have to assess it against all of the policies of local plan and make a balance in terms of how we weigh up um, the, the proposal in terms of acceptance or conflict with local plans. There are a number of policies within the local plan that support the continued use of, of rural enterprises to try and promote the economy. And so there are a number of policies in support of this proposal subject to localised impact. So it's it's the balance that we have made as officers in terms of what the noise impact is likely to be on the neighbouring properties, um, how we're looking to mitigate it and secure it by the conditions. Um, potentially use of attenuation fencing can be used if members are so minded to go down that route. Um, it's not proposed as part of the application and we didn't think it was necessary to make it acceptable, but members may come to a different view. Um, but I think I want to pass over to Adrian to see what additional points he wanted to raise. Thank you. Mr Noon. 
Yes, just coming back to the point on the pods themselves. I mean, what we need to sort of be aware of here is this, this is effectively approving an outside area for use ancillary to the restaurant. The planning application for the restaurant didn't show an outside area, which is why they are here with this application. What we're suggesting here, it, it, I mean, I think it, it would fall a long way short of being something that you could consider to be a beer garden. It would be incredibly tightly controlled by condition. First of all, we're limiting, suggesting we limit to no more than five pods and three outdoor tables. So eight dining, little dining, sort of places, yeah, sites, sites where you could eat out there. Um, so that's condition three. Condition four is suggesting um, because actually, you know, that whilst we have this suggested pod within the application, we are conscious that this is we're granting the use of land and so to the restaurant. And therefore, to cut off any argument in the future that any temporary structure could then lawfully be sited within that, this the outside dining area, we're then securing belt and braces here, the detail of the pods. So basically, they've got to tell us exactly what kind of pod goes in there. We're expecting it to be these the ones we've seen in the photographs today, but just to cut off any argument that another type of pod could go in there, we've got that conditioned forth. And we will always be able to control the appearance of the pods and what pods go in there. Um, we're also suggesting you know, that there would be uh, no music uh, played, um there's no out so condition eight no no music should be played or sound system used within the outside seating area um that's just to simply cover off the point that you know a speaker on a stand not within the pod we might 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 sort of be sneak through so we're, we're trying to think we, we we have to judge the application on its light you know reasonable interpretation of its likely impacts and in terms of people sitting outside dining without music and only eight dining areas available, subject to the conditions. Whilst, yes, we don't know what, we cannot guarantee what the user experience will be, but best judgment, reasonable application, of common sense approach to the interpretation of policy says, subject to those controls, the use of this area would be appropriate in a residential area, given that we have a number of third party properties quite nearby. Um, our experience elsewhere, dining, outside dining areas, in pubs in more urban areas, they very often work quite happily without histories of complaints. Um, so there is a fear of the unknown. There has been some of previous experiences here, but we have to look at this application on its likely impacts, given the controls we suggest can reasonably be imposed. Councillor Bolt? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, we're talking about, uh, as you say, five pods, three tables, that's eight seating areas for six per seating area. That's 48 people um, for eating. And uh, Mrs. DeFries has said about um, the clinking of glasses. Uh, it, is this extending the licensing as well by this plan? Because obviously it, is that part of the licensed premises where the pods are? Mrs. DeFries. Licensing falls under a separate application process. So as part of planning, we do not control the license or licensable area. Um, if they wanted to extend the licensable area, then they'd have to put in a separate application through licensing, which would go through its own separate process. So in effect, they wouldn't be able to serve alcohol out there. Um, I, my understanding is it, it um, controls where you can serve it from. So I, my understanding is that they're licensed from the bar, so you'd be right. able to take it from the bar and, and take a drink outside in the garden, but you wouldn't be able to sell it from the garden, is okay. my understanding, but it, it is a separate process. Anything further, Councillor Bolt? Not, a, not at the moment, thank you. OK, I've got Councillor Bradford, then Councillor Gibson. So Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll be quite brief. Um, it's taken a long time. This one, I showed you how difficult it is. We're down to we do, down to we don't. And there's some what I can see of it. All these things are right in the countryside. We haven't got no neighbours. And I'm afraid you've got some here. And that's what and that's what basically the problem is. I'm going to make a suggestion. Otherwise, we can, we can talk about this for a long time, I think. Um, uh, uh, why not, as a planning committee, give them a temporary licence for a year? Because this only might be temporary anyhow because of the COVID crisis and the government have 
uh, advised councils to give them special planning rights to let people extend their stuff outside and what have you for COVID safety reasons. And why, why not give them a temporary uh, a temporary license for a year to do it and try it and see what happens and come back in a year's time and there's no no complaints or no ha real bad noise problems and then go again. And if they'd gone for a license already, it's the cart before the horse. They should have got this planning before they went for the license, to be frank. Mrs. DeVries? Um, I think there's confusion over the license. That There's an existing license on the site for the restaurant, which doesn't affect this application at all. Um, in terms of the temporary consent, there was a recommendation from um, Wimden Parish Council that the use is limited to two years. Um, they've applied for a permanent consent. Having assessed it um, from an officer perspective, we're not raising any objection to a permanent consent, but if members um, are, are raising concern about potential for it being a permanent consent, it could be an option considered. Um, one year is recommended by Councillor Bradford, two years were recommended by the Parish Council, um, but it, it would sorry, be a different sorry, sorry, recommendation. Don't... Sorry, Just to move things on a bit, I'm going to... I'm going to well, let's have a compromise between the two, 18 months. I'm going to promote 18 months. There you go. And see what happens after 18 months. That's a fair chance for everybody, then I think. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. I've, Chairman. I'm sorry. Sorry. That's okay. I've got Councillor Gibson and then Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, I was going to go over uh, the the amount of actually seats out there, like um, Councillor uh, Bolt brought up about it. actually that's a that's a medium sized restaurant in the front garden um i would say again that i think this should be going in a different a different area um i would um i wouldn't want this to be the permission to be granted for permanent for this to be permanent and i think if you're going to build pods and put pods so you need to start with some something that's higher quality than plastic pods if you're just putting them out because they're going to be there they can be there like this is permanent a permanent and i'd like to look at slide eight again um where i just wanted to know the relation the, the one of the pod the building be behind is that the or what building is that behind is that the actual restaurant mrs debris you're sorry you're on mute Apologies. Um, that was to the back of the main building, so it was just um, stored there when I did the site visit. So that's not in the location where it's proposed to be going as part of this application. It was just an example of the pod, so members had a point of reference for the meeting. Right, OK, I got confused about that one. On, on, on slide uh, nine, um, you talked about screening. Um, the screening would, uh, and the fencing rather, the fencing would go on the inside of that screening so if, you, um, if that if that if that um was proposed yeah so currently the proposal is a 10 meter buffer of landscaping here and then an additional five meter buffer here um at the moment there isn't any fencing proposed but if members had concern about the length of time that that may take to establish um i would suggest they could put up attenuation fencing along this line between the 10 and five meter buffer. So you've still got a soft finish to the road frontage. You've got a soft fit finish with inside the site, but you could put attenuation fencing along sort of this edge and potentially this edge um, if members considered it reasonable. But I think the one thing I would highlight is if you're looking at a temporary consent, obviously there are costs to um, putting up attenuation fencing, which if it's only gonna be for a limited period of time, um, would would have an implication for the business. So whether whether they'd be able to do that or not, I I can't comment. Yeah. Okay. I I'm not really into that anyway. I think that they're in the wrong place and the wrong thing. So I, w I wouldn't be supporting a permanent situation of that. Really. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott, and then Councillor Bolt. Councillor Scott. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was going to support what Alan uh, Councillor Bradford had said in that um. Could we actually put um, a limitation of, say, 18 months as a temporary solution here and then reconsider? Um, <clears throat> but I was going to actually say that perhaps we ought to um, insist that the attenuation fence 
is put in place um, because that would mitigate against the sort of noise and disturbance because it will take time for a hedge or something to grow there. Plus, I noticed there is actually um, electric wires in that corner or along that fence somewhere. So I guess you won't be able to have, you know, trees that grow um, to perhaps screen the area. So I just, if um, Councillor Bradford was proposing that, I would second it. I, I think all I would say, Councillor Scott, is in terms of the attenuation fence, I think we have to, we can only put conditions on that we think are, are reasonable. And I think the question would be whether it'd be reasonable to put up a permanent structure for a temporary permission. I think if we were granting the permanent permission, then the, the, the fence becomes reasonable. I think we would struggle to, to make out that it's reasonable on the basis that within 18 months, the whole thing could be taken away if it hadn't worked out. But but that's a balance that members will have to, to, to take. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mr okay. Debris, any further comment on that? Um, I, I was perhaps going to suggest that if we were going for the temporary solution, not make the attenuation fencing a condition. Um, if it's something that the, um, I mean, obviously the applicants dialed into this meeting and just heard the full debate. If it's something they're minded to do and they want to put up um, an attenuation fence during that temporary period, by all means, they they are free to do so as long as it's set back from the highway. Um, but it, I think it would be unreasonable to impose it as a condition if if members are supporting a temporary consent only but obviously you know noise impacts will be a consideration when the scheme back comes back round so it may be in the applicant's interest to do it but i don't think it's reasonable to do it from a member's perspective okay uh i've then got councillor bolt yeah i, I, I think i agree with the the comments that mrs de has just said um the, the only problem with giving it a temporary um one month oh, sorry one year two years um none of the screening will have established enough to have um stopped any impact of noise on that uh, i think that, that my feelings are that the uh, potentially this is going to have quite an impact on the um two immediate neighbors it definitely um and, and with that in mind i'd, I'd like to recommend against the officer's recommendation, should I say. OK. I've not got any other members indicating at present. Uh, having said that, I've just seen the hand is now up. Uh, just bear with me one moment. Councillor Kingham Councillor and Councillor Kingham. Hendry. Yeah, I've got Councillor Kingham. And then, uh, yeah, Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. I might be down in the corner, but I'm still here. Um, I'd like to um, second uh, Councillor Bolt's um, proposal. Obviously, we have a an, uh, uh, we have another proposal that's been moved and seconded before that, so we will take that first. What I would say to Councillors Bolt and Kingham is obviously, if you're moving for a recommendation for refusal, we would need to have the planning reasons that you have in place so that members know what they would be voting for should they wish to vote for refusal. Um, we just, just need to make sure that everyone's clear uh, as to what that would be. Uh, I also have Councillor Revens indicating that he's seconding, but I'm not quite sure what he's seconding at the moment. So Councillor Revens? Yeah, I was going to second uh, Councillor Bolt's proposal, um, but Councillor Kingham has uh, beaten me to it. I wouldn't suggest it's uh, against policies D24 and D25 about amenity. Okay. Fine, I have one further hand that is showing us, us up, but I can't see whose it is at the moment. Uh, was Did someone mention uh, Councillor Hendry wanted to comment? Uh, yeah, I, sorry, Mr Chairman, I did actually put something in the chat, but I don't know, I don't know why you didn't see my name coming up because it's not there. I, I've just looked on Google how much these things actually cost, these pods. And it's between one and three and a half thousand pounds, depending on the quality, which one you want to buy. This business in itself with these pods, not, not the inside restaurant, just the pods is kind of seasonal because nobody's going to sit out there January and February in the cold and want the pod to, to have a dinner or whatever. It's unfair to ask these people to have a 12 to 18 month trial run for the pods. Simply in that, if you take it on a, a business perspective, the money they have to outlay to get this set up in the first place, put it all outside in the garden, then have the customers in. You take the turnover from April to April, which has got a short window somewhere in the middle. 
the, the revenue that they're going to take back in may not make any profit or very little in the first year because this type of business rarely does. So then you spill over into the, the second year, the, the, the third part of the 18 months. If they haven't made no revenue, that's down to them, okay, or, or very little. Then the council comes in and says, you've had your 18 month trial, we don't like it, that's it, end off. They wouldn't be able to sell the pods as second hand for anything like what they've paid for them. They've lost all this money that they've outlaid in the first place. Generally speaking, this 18 month trial, it just doesn't work. Well, not for them, it wouldn't, it doesn't work at all. And I can't see why it, why anybody's even putting that motion forward. Because if you think about it on finance and terms and, and liability, it just doesn't work. And I stand by what I first said. I put forward the uh, the case officer's recommendation. Thank you. OK, that's that's fine. Sorry, but certainly... Doug, Alistair. Thank you, Sorry? members. Sorry, uh, I don't. I, I'm, I don't I, no, Councillor Hendry, if you can just don't. There, there was a member mentioned something, but I, I couldn't hear what he said and, and he hadn't indicated that he wanted to speak. So um, if if we, uh, I, I've got Mrs Nicholson indicating that she wishes to uh, to have a word. Yes, sorry, I'm here, please. Mrs Nicholson? Yes, sorry, Chairman. I, I just want to confirm. You said that um, got a proposal on the second um, Yep. Councillor so Hendry had proposed to grant, but I can't see him seconding it. Agreed. Um, Councillor Bradford had proposed originally one year and is now 18 months, and that was seconded by Councillor Scott. Was that seconded by Councillor Scott? Yep. And then, um, then Councillor Scott has proposed refusal, and that was seconded by Councillor. Uh, yep, Councillor Bolt, seconded by Councillor Kingham. So the the first proposal that we had moved and seconded was the proposal of Councillor Bradford, which was the 18 month proposal, uh, temporary permission. It, and I, and as I understood it, Councillor Bradford, the proposal was on the basis that it would it would enable the, the the pods to be put in place. It would actually then show whether or not there was an ongoing noise issue. Uh, at, or not, and if there wasn't, then obviously that would be something that could be looked at on a more permanent basis. Is that correct? That's right, Mr. Chairman. And by that period of time, the country will have settled down. Everybody will have a fair assessment of what's going forward. And regard some of the comments Alistair Hendry made, it's very rare people pay for things today. A lot of it's leased. Uh, again, that would be a matter though that's outside of the of of. Oh, of very our much, very, very much. And I, I, I'm just putting Alistair in the real world. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, no, no problem. Thank you. Okay, right. Counts Councillor Gibson. Thank you. Um, I just like to say as well that you can't sit in these in the summer because it's like sitting in a polytunnel and an enclosed polytunnel uh, tunnel without any air. So you can't sit in the heat of the summer either. Thank you. Mrs. DeVries, is there anything you wish to comment on before we move to the vote, uh, which is as things stand at the moment the, the proposal is for the temporary permission for the reasons outlined i think just for clarity i'm assuming that's without any attenuation fencing but obviously it'd be a choice of the applicant if they wish to erect that during the course absolutely i'll just conf confirm that with uh, with councillors bradford and scott that, that the 18 months does not include trying to put on the condition about the attenuation fence but should the applicant wish to put some form of acoustic fencing in to, to reduce the potential issues, then that would be a matter for them. Is that correct, Councillor Bradford? That's correct. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. Councillor Scott? Yes, yes, certainly. Yeah. Okay. So I'm also just seeing on the chat uh, that someone wanted to second Councillor Hendry's proposal. That was Councillor Glassford. We will get to that potentially in terms, depending on what happens with the other proposals that are in front of that proposal. So we'll start for clarity for members. The first proposal we have, that has been, which was seconded, is for the 18 months. That is the vote that we will take. If that is passed, that is what is the position. If it fails, we will then move to the second recommendation that was moved and seconded, which is for the refusal. And then if that fails, we'll come on to the third one. So. Hopefully members are clear as to uh, to where we are. So the first proposal that we have, which was for the temporary permission of 18 months to be to be granted, uh, 
We'll start this time, please, with Councillor Facey. Yes, Chairman. Um, here in body, Chairman and Soul. Very interesting debate, Chairman. Very interesting. Yeah, Chairman, I've been here, as I say, right through the whole debate. Listen, took it all in, and I'm going to go in favour of Alan Bradford's recommendation, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Seen and hear everything, as I explained already, I think it's grossly unfair, and I'm against. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Uh, yes, um, been and heard the whole debate, and I'm in favour of the recommendation for a temporary um, situation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Hello, yeah, I've uh, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Yep, thank you. Seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Glassford. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the whole debate and I am against. Councillor Granter, I believe you indicated that you we lost connection, so you're not able to vote. Yes, that's quite right, Chairman. I'm sorry about that. No problem. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. I'm against. I've seen and heard everything. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. I've seen and heard everything and I'm against. Councillor Bolt. Seen and heard everything against. Councillor Bradford. Seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman. I am for. Councillor Kingham. Seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Councillor Revens. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Seen and heard the whole debate and my vote is against. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. Seen and heard the whole debate and I'm against. Thank you. I've also seen and heard the whole debate and I'll vote for. I believe that's all members have voted who were able to. So, Mrs. Nicholson, if you could let us know the uh, the numbers. Thank you, Chairman. That's four in support, ten against, one lost connection. So that is clearly lost. So if we move then to the next recommendation, which was the the recommendation for refusal, and I will just come back to to Councillor Bolt for clarification of the, the reasons for refusal, please. Um, thank you. D25, policy D25, going down through it, uh, loss of privacy, potential for loss of light on the growth of uh, any, any boundary fence, uh, the noise and disturbance, and the um, future living conditions of future occupants, sorry, living conditions of future occupants. Um, just the potential that this is a, although they're calling them temporary pods, they, they, we're giving permanent um, planning permission for that use out there. Can Thank I you. just come back on a read. couple of points, please? please um, in, in terms of loss of light because of the boundary treatment, the slide that's up before members shows the existing um, sort of established planting on the road frontage. So there's already quite high planting on this roadside boundary. Um, and whilst the development would increase the depth of planting, um, I don't think it would you know, necessarily result in any sort of increased height or intrusion or loss of light, which is set out in the report. Um, in terms of noise, um, is is it that we're saying it will result in an unacceptable level of noise or is it that we're saying insufficient information has been provided to confirm that the proposal would be acceptable in terms of noise information because it's it's two slightly different things um and in terms of the um sort of dominance or height or impact of the actual structures that they're, they're fairly low height um things i think the highest point of the building of the dome um, is sort of just above eaves level so it's sort of maybe two and a half meters in height which within the site behind the existing screening is not particularly dominant outside of the site so it's what i'm after is, is clarification in terms of if if you're still satisfied you want to pursue all those routes 
or um, and and with the noise, is it that we're satisfied it would result in an impact, or that insufficient information has been provided currently to assure that there isn't an impact? Certainly, Councillor Bolt. Just just before you come back, the only thing I would also add is the advice we've always had in the past is is it is better to have a one solid reason than two or three sort of make weights because the make weight ones actually can undermine your argument but uh, coming back to to councillor bolt and it'll be councillor kingham just to confirm their their reasons so councillor bolt with regards to the loss of light we've got again we, we don't have any information as to what is going to be grown there um, we don't have the information on the noise um, but with 48 people out there there's going to be a considerable amount extra noise um, and obviously that would come down to um, D25 and also the, the two points of the living conditions of future occupants um, to, to, to be taken into consideration. The, the privacy aspect of it is the fact that uh, it is allowing the use of a part which has previously been denied access which goes straight up to a boundary fence um, which potentially, you know, is is going to be a, a, a problem for privacy with the. Uh, it hasn't got a name of the house, but the the the, the house and garden that's immediately adjacent to the uh, northeast. So again, just just again to try and confirm. So what what in effect we're looking at is is that there is insufficient detail within the application to to ensure that the noise would not impact on the neighbouring dwellings. And have impact on the the occupiers in in the future of of those those dwellings. I, th I think probably on the on the landscaping we we might struggle in the sense of there is as I understand it and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Devries, a 10 meter buffer to the road already. What we're looking at is another five meters inside of that. So we would be saying that would have an impact over the other 10 meters, and that I think we might struggle to defend. But I don't know what your view is. Yeah, I mean, from from what I've heard, I would be more comfortable defending a reason for refusal on insufficient information in terms of noise information to confirm the degree of impact for the scale of development proposed, um, because we don't have those details. So the concern is there could be an impact. It hasn't been demonstrated. There isn't an impact, and therefore, you know, we could defend that as, as part of an appeal. In terms of landscaping, there's an existing high landscape boundary. It's the depth of the landscape boundary that would be increased as a result of this development. Um, you know, if it's a route you really, really wanted to pursue, I would again suggest insufficient information, but it's an increase in depth rather than an increase in height. And, and with the increase in depth, in my opinion, you wouldn't get the same impact on the neighbours if we were looking at reinstating a high boundary treatment right on the edge of the boundary, which isn't what we've got in this case. But um, I would suggest from what I've heard, it's insufficient information in respect of a noise assessment to clearly establish that there wouldn't be a detrimental impact on the amenities of surrounding residents. Councillor Bolt. Yeah, totally agree with that. I, I must admit, I'm just looking at that photo now. I thought that that had been grubbed out, the front boundary fence when you said that um, uh, underneath the pile on there, but I can see that there is still some of the existing boundary in there, um, yeah. apart from what's been cut down. So I thought that that would had all been removed or was all to be removed. No, the, the existing plantings quite quite established and quite mature. Oh, Obviously, right. these will be in leaf um, now. They weren't when I did the site visit um, and the bits that were pulled out was were brambles that were climbing the, the pylon. OK, so you're, yeah, you're happy you with that. that. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Yes. OK, and just to confirm, Councillor Kingham as the second, are you happy with that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think um, Mrs. Debris is summed it up very well and I would uh, be happy to go along with that as a recommendation. OK, I'm seeing there's a hand gone up somewhere and I, again, I'm struggling to see whose it is. Um, Councillor Gibson, your hand is up. Is that? A, a, Hey, yeah, hey, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't know whether I could speak or not now at all because yes. um, because you were directing the questions and um, moving forward. I just thought that that boundary, uh, the the screening, um, I didn't think that it would be sufficient actually uh, because you can actually put large trees 
under there even if that was that was the reason for um it, it doesn't matter now anyway i just i, I it was a reverse of what uh, councillor bolt said about the uh the screening being a problem that i think the problem is that it's not enough you wouldn't be able to put enough in there to um prevent any sort of pollution from the site that's all that's all okay. i want to say thanks and again just before i move to the vote mr noon has indicated in the chat Are you there, Mr. Noon? Sorry, yes, sorry. I it was really just a clarification of the reason for views of which I, I had understood, and I think the debate has gone round to it that it's the 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 the, the noise the potential for noise and disturbance to the detriment of the living conditions of surrounding residential properties. Um I was going to sort of urge a little bit of caution on the loss of light issue simply because it's natural registration which falls outside of planning control normally anyway. And given that the screening they are showing that they could achieve. I don't think that I, you know, I, I wasn't really seeing a, a clear reason for overlooking on loss of privacy um, on those grounds. So noise and disturbance was where I was going to suggest. And I think the debate has taken us there. And yeah. I was just going to mention both policies, D24, which is noise pollution and D25, which is residential amenity. I think that both policies are relevant. Absolutely. And I think Mr. DeVries, you're, you're happy that that's the case, that it is the insufficient evidence that it will not have an Im unacceptable impact in terms of policies D24 and 25 on yeah. noise and disturbance and the immunity of the neighbours. Yeah. OK. Members, if you're then clear on, on that, that is the proposal that will be coming before you now, uh, and you'll need to vote for or against the refusal of permission based on the, the grounds that you've just heard discussed. So we'll start this time with uh, Councillor Murphy. Chair, um, I'm in favour of refusal. I've seen and heard the debate and I'm in favour of refusal. Thank you very much. Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate and my vote is in favour of refusal. Thank you, Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I've been present and heard the whole debate and I am for. Yes, thank you. Councillor Bradford. I've heard the whole debate, Mr Chairman, and on this occasion I'm going to abstain. Wow. Councillor Bolt. I've uh, seen and heard the whole debate for refusal. Councillor Perry. Thank you. Yes, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Yes, seen and heard the whole debate and I'm for. Just to confirm, that's for the recommendation for refusal. It is. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Granter, obviously, you said was absent, so we move to Councillor Glassford. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate uh, uh, against the proposal. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I am for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Gibson. Yeah, I've seen and heard the whole debate, and I'm for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Is Councillor Scott there? I am. Yes, right. sorry, can you hear me? Can, we can now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, seen and heard the whole debate and I wish to abstain. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Hendry. Seen and heard everything, Mr Chairman, and I am against refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Seen, heard everything, Chairman, and I am going to abstain, Chairman. Okay, and I've also seen and heard the debate, and I will also vote for the proposal for refusal. I believe, Mr. Nicholson, that's all members who can vote have voted. Uh, yes, Chairman. Okay, it might take a little while to tot up this time, so I'll let yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My voting paper looks a bit messy. Right, let's go for nine in support, two against, three abstentions, one loss connection. That's what I've got. So, Mrs. Lehman, is that what you've got? <laughs> I, I do, Chairman. Thank you. OK, so that is clearly carried that the permission has been refused. That 
brings us members to the end of the uh, the applications that we have before us. We've got some reports uh, to move to, which is item 6.1. Just before we move on to the reports, a couple of things just to mention. One is just a reminder to all members that we have the annual training is in the diary, I believe, Mr. Nickerson, for the 13th of May. Notification has been sent around to all members. Yes, Chairman. And just to remind members that that training is is compulsory. We have to all of us have to have that training. We cannot sit on the committee unless we have had that training. So uh, please make sure that you uh, you do uh, attend that because that will be what enables us to attend the May meeting. And on a similar vein, um, just before we can move on to the, uh, as I say, onto the reports, uh, I just think it's worth mentioning that uh, unfortunately this is Councillor Bradford's last development committee because he's moving on to bigger and better things. So uh, Councillor Bradford just wanted to thank you for all your input over the many years that you've been on this committee. Uh, it's you, You've always brought a, a unique perspective, I think it would be fair to put in, into a number of applications and it has been very much appreciated. We're, we are sorry to lose you, but obviously uh, very pleased that you're uh, you're going to be taking on the role that you will be within the council. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. I could just say I've enjoyed working with you as a chairman. I've done it for 14 years, right? And I've enjoyed with, you know, I've seen a lot of people come and go on the planning committee. I have the greatest respect for all of them because it's not, not an easy job to do on the council. It really, really isn't. And, uh, you know, I wish you all good luck in future developments and everything else okay but no doubt i might sit in on the occasional one and i'm hopefully and layla will invite me to that training course i want to train so i'm a bit more scratched up in the world of north Heatherton. all right so uh but thank you very much mr chairman and, and thank you to all members you know it's a hell of a learning curve and it's the most interesting committee within the council take it from me thank, thank you, you all of it. thank you thank you Councillor bradford Mrs. DeVries, do you, is it yourself or Mr. Noon who's going to take us through the the, the reports? Um, I'm quite happy to run through them for members. Okay. So if there's Please any questions. Ahead. So um, 6.1 is just planning appeals we've received. Um, we've received an application, uh, an appeal against prior approval for an, a sort of um, a mobile inst, um, a mobile mast for telephones. Um, and an appeal against prior approval for change of use of a shop, which was class A1 to um, residential in Wemden. So that's two appeals received, if anyone's got any questions. I'm not seeing anything on the chat, so no, if you move us on to the ones decided. Yeah, so appeals decided. Um, we had the application that was determined by a planning committee contrary to officer's recommendation for one West Key. It's actually been withdrawn, so it didn't get a decision. The applicant withdrew it. Um, I think that's because they've found an alternative site uh, for the takeaway, so they didn't get a decision on that one. They they withdrew it prior to the decision. Um, and we had an appeal allowed for the erection of a two story extension. Um, to Holly Tree Farm, New Road Stone Allison. That was allowed under the um, sort of planning appeals. And we had a lawful development certificate, um, which was dismissed. So um, inspector decided on us for batch nurseries. Um, it had a sort of uh, licensable caravan site, which they were in breach of the license. They were trying to demonstrate that they'd been breaching the license uh, long enough to establish the site as a caravan and camping site. Uh, which should have had planning permission, um, but uh, the case was they didn't demonstrate they'd been in breach for a sufficient period of time for us to support it. And then there's a number of issues in terms of um, the location outside of the settlement boundaries and within high areas of flood risk. Any questions on that? Uh, Councillor Bradford, you've indicated, is that on the, uh, the Limpsham application? And it's on neither application. I just wanted to thank a few other people at the end of the meeting. That's all. OK, no oh, worries. Sorry, I'm sorry to confuse you again. again. That's all right. It doesn't <laughs> take much, Councillor Bradford, don't worry. <laughs> so moving on to the last one of the appeals decided. Um, is Carrots Farm Shop. Um, this was the larger scheme of the scheme that members saw last month at committee. Um, this one was down to go to a virtual public inquiry, so would have had a lot of costs associated with it had it progressed. Um, because the smaller scheme got resolution to grant, 
um, the applicant withdrew the larger scheme. So again, that was a withdrawn appeal. Thank you. Again, I'm seeing nobody else commenting. So the last one is 6.3. Um, so this is applications with Section 106 agreements that have recently um, gone out the door. So land at Brew Farm, the hybrid application that members saw at committee um, a long while back for 171 dwellings and the outline for a school site. Um, that one's now been issued with 106 agreement. So that's been that decision's now gone out. Thank you. Again, I'm not seeing any comments or questions on that one. So that concludes the, the, the business of the meeting, then we will close.